You can do it if you think you can. Expert, come on. You can do it if you think you can. Yes, you can. You can stream. You can stream. You really, really can stream, Expert, if you think you can. Woohoo! We're live! Hallelujah. That was close. That was close. God, this, this office is starting to look a bit of a mess. But there is a reason for looking a bit mess. Okay, so. A package arrived from Kobe. And I was very happy. And I thought, well, I can finish off HMS Belfast. But I thought, before I do a stream where I announce I'm going to finish Belfast, I should probably check that I do actually have the parts to finish Belfast. And then we found out that they had sent me a pack, which is good. But the pack they'd sent me, not necessarily the pack they were supposed to. Not the pack I thought I'd asked for, or the pack they thought they'd sent me, was the pack that arrived. So, Belfast is still not quite completed. But she is looking more like she is, and she is actually now armed. So she's got her secondaries in place. So she can now officially fire at you with four inch guns. And she's got some pom-poms as well, because that's what I decided to look closer to. So she's got four inch and she got pom-poms. And I do agree, the four inch are very, very, very cute, but also very fiddly. But, yeah. She is looking more like a ship now. Her hull is nice and smooth. Lovely and smooth. Mm -hmm. And I would add... Her propellers. They're fun. Give them half a chance, and they will go wrong on you. Half a chance is all they require. But yeah. There she is. She's good. <sighs> right then, so hello everyone. Um, I have to announce the patron vote, which by the way, for the first time ever, we have maxed out the options. Um, it should be live now. And I will go and click on it, and so I can put it up on the side of the screen. The dirt should be live. Should be live, he says. Saved it. Did it all go live? Because I just did it. Scheduled. Ah, I know why it hasn't. Okay. And that's going to be annoying, but it's... Let's sort out this quickly. Make sure it goes to today. And oh, good Lord. schedule for right in. 
So, the vote is scheduled. It will go live at quarter past, so I've got, I will just say hello to everyone and then I'll talk it through. For some reason, I'd scheduled it for tomorrow at 7 o'clock rather than today at 7 o'clock, and that's just... Nah, that's my day. Today, so far, I was really happy on the Total War game, and then I managed to lose my third rates very stupidly, because I treated them like they were an out of third rates in real life rather than third rates on the Total War computer game, and I should have remembered that. Hmm. It happens. The trouble is, this is the trouble when you're a naval destroyer and you play a really fun naval game. You get so wrapped up into it, you think, oh, Yes! This is a naval game. Yes, I can play. I, I, I can do as a naval historian. And then you go, Form line! Do this! We'll do this! We're we'll acting like this! And then it... And they, do, they don't work. It doesn't work. Because it's not really the Royal Navy running the ships. It's... The, the, uh, it's the electrons, and they're just not the same. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carver Gasberg. Hello, Mark Harkness. Hello, some video photographer. Hello, Tasha Duvichel. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Night6831. Uh, hello, Mr. Serenity's End. Hello, DeBrock. Hello, Steve Clark. Hello, Zaski. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Unon. Hello. Mm. Hello, Tristan Dunn. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, DG40. Try and keep politics out of the stream, please. I know, even if it is Scottish politics, and I realise this is someone who drinks Iron Brew and does talk about Scotland a lot, but try and keep the politics out of the stream. It just tends to cause arguments, and this is a history stream. History discussion. Live. Hi, Colin Cameron. Hello, Mirabella. Hello, Melanie. Hello, Abzaski. Hello, Tanif. Hello, and Death Squad. How revolutionary would a 7mm .288 rifle have been? Have been. It would have been useful. I'm not sure if revolutionary, but it would have been useful. My, uh, my Belfast will not take that long to build. Kobe are already sending another bag my way. So, apologies for asking again, as I know you're busy, but is it still possible to have the Kuyo Nose further reading list sources somehow, as they weren't in, weren't in the comment response video? Dang, I did forget to add them in the comment response video. Uh, yes, they will come at some point. I'll put them up this week. I will put them up at some point this week. I have them written out, but it's actually because I wrote them out by hand. <laughs> Nightbot is being respectful. That's good. Hello, bug guy, Tintin two nine. Hello, Ian Straddling. Uh, hello, Stafford. Now, that's right, now the types of everyone Amazon class for the How do you rate the class of ships for their service and legacy? Mm, they were useful ships. They filled the holes. They weren't really great, but they were built at a time of a lot of change, and they were built cheaply and quickly to cover while that change was going on. They did their jobs. Richards, title war naval fights are highly suspect. Yes, they are, because I then, afterwards, I then just fought the battle like I would. And basically, I remembered to treat the ships like I was treating a land campaign where everyone could just charge at their opponents and ignore the rules of naval doctrine and naval warfare, and they did, and it was successful. It was fun watching you struggle. No, it wasn't fun watching you struggle. I lost my third rates to pirates. I'm annoyed. However, I am now pillaging the pirates' homes, so if I can't, if you're going to use a capture my third rates and use them against me, I will use my remaining third rates to land troops and take over your take over your islands and turf you turf the pirates out of their homes. Hello, frame fifteen. That's what, did you forget to do Total War Shuffle? Um, the trouble is, Michael Cooch, 
you have to sail in the direction of the opponent. And yes, you can theoretically do other things, but yeah, that don't don't get it. It's it's fine. That I do know what I'm doing. Usually, I'm if I'm sailing directly in the wind, I have an idea in my head. I just have to remember that the total warships cannot do what the ships in my head can do because the ships in my head are based on the real ones, not the total war ones. Also, good evening. Can you guess my question? It's my usual one. Mm, not in the moment. I was asking, by the way, if anyone has a spare 270,000 pl uh, pl uh, PLN, that's 55,000 quid, the Polish Navy is selling X RP MOA, a decommissioned Project 206 Mighty Well. Someone tell uh, Drac that. He might consider it for his new, uh, 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 for his new summer house. No worries, Subvictoria. Lots of people talk politics. It's just... And I can understand why on this channel people would, especially about Scotland. But, um... Yeah. All I'll leave it is, I'm not a fan of the SNP. I think they promise a lot, but don't deliver. But that's it. It's been announced that the former RN Type 21 frigate Ambuscade will be returning to UK to become a frigate museum ship. I'll be overjoyed if it actually happens. When is Bill Trump's coming out? Um, this week, we I had a very tired Drac and a very tired Jamie, and we didn't record it. So... Next week at some point. And yes, these if anyone wants to know what these are, these are in the UK what you can get from Taco Bell. Which are um these cinnamon puffs. They're very nice, but my sister ordered them, thinking they were gluten free. And it turns out they're not. And so me, who's currently on a diet and who's trying to avoid things like this, got given them and told, eat. And this is the trouble with my version of dieting. I am still the family um, dustbin. If you could meet the Azole version of H. Mr. Renown interview, what would you ask? I haven't seen the Azole version of H. Mr. Renown yet, and if I could meet a version, a personified humanoid version of H. Mr. Renown, honestly, considering how good her sister was at dancing, I'd probably ask her for dancing lessons. Especially if that would give me a lot of time to talk about naval history with her. Disturbingly Moorish. All right. <laughs> you go to you. I'd say I did have a fun day today because my um. This is what happens. My um. I was talking to my mum and she was going. Ah, good. You know, you haven't been paid yet, and all that. You get paid on Monday, and I went, yeah, yeah. She went, thank God for that YouTube money. Yes, I went, yes. She went, so you're holding on to that right until you get paid. And I went, um, no. I spent roughly two hundred and fifty quid on books today. And she went, that's better than you normally do. So, you know, 
I've now had both my accountant and my mother tell me I'm good with finance recently. Or at least a good one of them. My accountant tell me I'm surprisingly well organized, and my mother tell me she's surprised I spent less money than she thought I would on books. This is an improvement. There are lots of books. There, the books should be listed in the description below. So, I'm just getting some iron brew up before I start discussing the patron vote. My mom tried to make me and my sister do dancing lessons. Instead, I read history lessons. Um, honestly, I have a, I have an aunt and uncle who are absolutely obsessed with dancing, and because of my family cultural background, I have done some dance training, but not in sort of in sort of uh, Highland and Gaelic dancing to an extent. Um, it was interesting. I am not the world's most natural dancer. Desktop capture. Da 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 da. Patron vote. Here we go. There we go. I'm gonna have to alter the screen, the camera, aren't I, to be able to see me. So, right then, what have we got as the voted options? We have got Paul Thompson, the attack on Copenhagen in 1801 and the following operations in the Danish waters until the fall of Napoleon. Paul Thompson, the German use of captured Navy ships in World War II. Carl von Gasper's diesel cruise marine, what if history of Germany not developing high pressure steam propulsion but sticking to diesel. Um, but stick to diesel to keep it a thing. Please note, we have maxed out the polling options. Um, Carver Gasberg's flotillas of Danube uh, throughout, uh, through the sieges of Belgrade in 1456 and January 1915. There were two uh, there were two questions about the Danube, and I honestly did flipping a coin to decide which one got in. Renan Stalin gets his dream battle cruiser battleship fleet. What is NATO with Western Allies' response? Interesting. Robert Locke. Smokey Joe's, Dunkirk and beyond. Rubber Lock, DSOE in the sea. Michael 66, already got some votes. The 50 gun ship of the line, covering how it came to be introduced and its uses. Uh, Michael 66, IJN infrastructure model 2. If you'd been Navy Minister in, say, 1930s, what improvements would you have made? Cancelled, Yamato and Mushashi. Um, probably get into a few other things. Anginor, reintroduction on naval treaties in the modern current age. Blackburn Maximus, no second war with China. Japan is said concentrates on naval build-up and infrastructure. What changes? Rob B. Stanerick, uh, the naval part of the British conquest of Canada. Mm, missing an eye there, but I didn't notice when I copied and pasted it. Andrew Waite, Argentine aircraft carrier. ARI Vincent de Mille, from the construction and time as HS Vineral to, to Falklands War. Jack Ray, history of Stanflex and why the US doesn't use it. Mm-hmm. That is about as... I can't make it any bigger than that. Uh, can I zoom in? Oh, yes, I can zoom in. That's good for you, everyone to read. Um, Danny Wright, Italian Force Infrastructure in the Red Sea in 1940. What were the capabilities and plans of those forces? Robert Locke, Operation Meridian. What happened and what might have been? Robert Locke, Ra 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 Pearl Harbor. 11th of June 1940. Raid on Masoa and its impact on Italy's naval and military operations in Africa. Robert Locke, you will notice that a couple of yours are missing. There is a reason for that. If I couldn't put any... If I had to cut anyone, I decided to cut the person who suggested the most two of the oars rather than cut from anyone else's because it just seemed fairer. Because you'd suggested like seven. So I thought five suggestions was still fine. Uh, Glenn Stewart, if Project Orion is completed in the 1970s and proves viable for the 10,000 ton ship, what does space battleships look like? Run on. The Iron develops gas turbines for ships, but not aircraft in the early to mid-20s. How does this impact construction designs? Are your destroyers and all oh, ships are going to be very interesting. So, 
Roblox, uh, September 1943, S54 and S61's voyage from Toronto to Venice, channeling the Indian Elsonian frigate and capture Venice. Vincenzo Abate, uh, uh, Vincenzo, uh, Vincenzo Abate, uh, the Narvik campaign from naval triumph to land exit evacuation, so promising a start to bitter an end. Bernora and uh, alternative history, Green Boys of Jutland. What difference would this uh, this have on the battle of the aftermath of immediate and immediate post war? Belnora, Lex Gabina, Pompey versus Pirates. Why had piracy gotten so out of hand when Rome controlled the Med after the Punic Wars? And Belnora, the not so Royal Navy, the RN Junior Interregnum. And how they were actually key to keeping the Interregnum going and keeping the um, Protectorate still fine. And you will see this is a slide from this week's Long Patrol on Tuesday when I'm going to be talking about the steamships and conversion of the airships online. And um, probably not a built Shinano, but there again, she wasn't started till after they had been finished, and that was that saves quite a lot of it. 250 quid, that's one book, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, so again, you are the European island nation of Dogland during the age of sail. You have a modern cruise ship and enough oil and production industry to keep it running. How do you excise the most soft power? Probably offer to sell uh, to sail around Br the Ro the Royal uh, British and French or whoever you particularly like at that point's army and make sure they arrive where they need to arrive. Just wrong. I usually give up on the Electron Man Navy and let, and let have my XO deal the babble. It is honestly tempting. It is honestly tempting sometimes. My name's Waddle Shine to turn on. Normal folks have voice in their heads. I like the ships. That, don't joke. Don't joke. That is, that is sometimes what's up there. Um, it was a very interesting discussion once with... Uh, uh, someone who was doing an assessment of me, and it was a case of, so you have ships in your head? Yep. How? Why? Because I do. And I said, why was HMS renowned the SSBN play with bad luck? Honestly, construction. Can't, uh, my good, can't the flight researchers take care of dustbin duties? No, because in, in the nicest way, it's got sugar in it, so they don't let them have it. There is a reason why... According to both fluffy research assistants, Papa has the good biscuits. But... Shh. Cousins... Whereas, currently, they're supposed to be on the light biscuits. Mm-hmm. The healthy option biscuits. There is New Jersey needed 220,000 sharp horsepower to get a free three knots. Hmm. So what books like? As I said, there's a list below in the description. Man, it's not, she not say, look, I'm going to take it as she said I did good, okay? Allow me to take the small victory where it, where it comes, even if it's not quite there. No, it was cold in here earlier when I got in here, so if you don't mind the hat hair... There you go. <sighs> I 
I think I'm, I've read the UK's VC10 jet had better operating costs than the American 707. What incentive does a UK Commonwealth superpower have to keep the V-bombers around as tankers when they could buy VC10 type? Probably not a lot. But honestly, it's going to depend if they've bought enough on them. Hi, Dan Freeman. That's good. Turbines in 20s. Destroyers with an F1 aero to stop them taking off in 20 and taking off. It would be interesting. Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Very good for clarifying that. Thank you for clarifying that, Wayne. Ruin. Although, to be honest, the RM might not use them in their odds because the tech would be the bleeding edge. <clears throat> it's going to depend. If they if they get them in time, that when they're building the their odds, they think they can get them, give them the edge. If they think they can use it to get them up to 28 knots or something like that, they'll go for it. How does the Monroe Doctrine get remembered? If the British and European colonial powers were able to tramper it, and the US has shown not to be able to enforce it. But that's the case what happened quite regularly. You have to remember, there are points in history when Brazil is stronger than America. And there's more to enforce a Mon version of the Monroe Doctrine than the Americans do. In fact, one of the rallying cries given to develop the fleet by um, Teddy Roosevelt. Not that the Royal Navy is so strong, it's that the Brazilian Navy is so strong. Some videos I've got my head, that's where I was in it. Cool. My Highness, IGN Minister Clark invests much in bulletproof vests, armored Kassaf cars, and heavy production detail before he makes the fleet to face other nations. He has to survive the enemy. Um, oh, I'm not sure I'd... I might do something a little bit nastier than that. I would invite the Navy, the Army to a conference to work out the defense of Japan. I invite them to come along. And then I blow them sky high. Oh, it was an accident. The ship that was transporting you to the meeting just went boom. That's what. Persons, please note, disinformation is what is usually referred to as blackmail material. If you want something from Uncle Axe, friends and tell other families about the, body, the full fat dog biscuits. No, because then I won't give the, you, as cousins, any of these biscuits when you come over to give to the dogs. And you know how it makes them wag their tails. Ask what ship, uh, what sh uh, shuttle power we need to get the renown, uh, get your renowned thirty-five knots. Well, she's a lot lighter. Um, let's see, my renown the other day. Mm hmm. She had a lot. I'm presuming you're talking about my one from UAD. Um, <clears throat> I 
at probably, considering how heavy she was, probably at least 160,000 shaft horsepower. Andrew, I salute you. I, Canadian, visited Discord my grandma in 2008, discovered Iron Bruder, fell in love, bought two times two litre bottles to bring her back in my carry-on. Um, I should tell you that we found in Canada, we we did get some very nice people turning up and helping us, uh, supplying us Iron Brew. It was very useful. And hopefully, there are going to be, before the end of the week, coming. We were hoping to get it up in... in um, by the end of February, but it's going to be the first week in January. You, are, There are going to be some announcements coming out that I think a lot of people are going to be very excited by. Uh... Steve Clark, Alex, in the drone world, there has been a lot of discussion of Tordial propellers. Water is different fluid medium than... Would they work similar to a pump jet? We discussed this on bilge pumps recently. They certainly do have some options. And there is certainly something which is worthwhile considering in them. But, it's going to be a while before, before you see them. Mainly because you've already got pump jets. So it's a case of, are they an improvement over what pump jets give you? And that improvement can be taken in one of two ways. Are they cheaper? Easier to maintain? Easier to build? Are they quieter? You know, there's going to be a lot of variables. Doctor, like, I could help but laugh historically, historically when a Q turret went boom. How is she not blown in half? I have no idea. I built them tough ships. Somebody from Toronto. I'm taking my girlfriend to Victorian Albert Museum. That will be interesting. It's very lovely. I should warn you that the cafe inside it is going to charge you an arm and leg. Hmm. Kind of, can you recommend a good book on World War II TN submarines and their war records? Clarified TN for me. Because there's T-boats, there's T boats, N boats, T to N boats, there's all sorts of things going around in my head of what you might mean in the various things. I'm thinking it's not that, but I, if you clarify TN, I might well have some books to and clarify for you. Actually, what if the US fought a war to colonial powers and British were not interested because they didn't get enough colonies and America lost? What is it likely afterwards? Um... Then you have a scramble for America like you did a scramble for Africa. If America loses then and Britain's then for Canada, etc. and its own colonies are at risk, it will scramble to take over as much of America as it can. If America's being cut up like China was, like Africa was... Britain will get in there quickly to try and protect its own interests. And you would probably be surprised at how much America might well want Britain to go in there. Andrew Cruz, I never drank that full liter. I was too irreverent. It happens. But, if you like Iron Brew, and I really should start getting some sort of funding from them for this, but I'm, I, I don't, so I can say this with a completely free heart. The 1901 is by far the best. It's a mild addiction going on.
Oh, yes, How convincing would Alan Garrick's uh, DS9 lines about Kunsens be in Japanese? Hmm. It would work. Excellent. So I didn't see the ultimate animals. Did HMS Qu Quindle's Ma Maximus Warspite defeat Yamoto for this World War II base ship? Um, for that, you see the 18 inch super. Uh, basically, I built a Super Queen Elizabeth with 18 inch guns. And um, instead of 15 inch, it even had the 8 gun layout. That comes out on Wednesday. It did beat Yamato. It lost once. It won twice. Nerodes only had 45,000 shaft horsepower. Um, but you have to remember, they are only they are thirty three thousand eight hundred tons standard, whereas mine thing was about a little bit heavier. Let's just say, and um, their only top speed is twenty three knots, and you have to remember the power requirements to go fast goes up like that, not like that. Squad. All it took was the life of one Japanese criminal, one American diplomat, and one self-respect of one IJN officer. That's a small price to pay. Attached to the shell, does the exciting news include a black man, black man? Nope. They might get added on, but not by me. If you want to, start message, uh, just start adding Dan and see if you can get the information out of him. It's bacon jerky, to an extent. And again, I was given a tub of it and told it has to be eaten today. And this was a few minutes before coming live. So I went, hmm, okay. RN. Ah, it is the RN submarines. Right then. So... Da, 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 da. Mm. Royal Navy submarines. Uh, right then. Now that's the post World War Two. That's the during World War Two one. Right. Design technology for submarines, British submarines. Norman Freeman's British submarines in two world wars. It's very good. And it's a good starting point. Uh, that's not helpful of you. You order books for later, not for now, okay? Stop falling out. That's not for light. And you. I expected better of you, Brown. I really did. <whistles> I 
Um, hmm. Where is the other book on the submarines? Is it there? I do have another book which is on Royal Navy submarines in the Mediterranean and what they got up to. And I cannot for the life of me see it at the moment. It is somewhere around here. But I cannot see it. Hang on. Could be it. Nope, no, that's on tanks. I wonder if my sister's borrowed it for a student who was doing a submarine project. Possibly. Possibly. Oh, I think so. I'd say that's the probably the likely have a likely current. But no, there is a good book on submarines in the Mediterranean. Oh. Magic, if you were to build 40,000 ton narrows, what would they look like? Probably the F3 layout, because then I could have them longer. Have the same armour, and armour, broadly speaking, armour layout over a larger hull, over a longer hull. Have more horsepower, get them up faster. What's better about 1901? It's the original recipe. Everything else is an imitation. That's what Britain would go in and say it was theirs previously, and therefore they have this to sort of claim. Also, anyone who disagrees can place their complaint with the first rates in port. Yes, pretty much. Something different. My brother, mother literally has 350 cans of 19 to 1 iron brew in the cellar. That is a woman, a lady after my own heart, a lady of the highest order. You should make sure that she gets many, many presents on Mother's Day and Christmas and her birthday. She is a very special person. <laughs> pretty much. Makuch, uh, pretty much, uh, let's see. Um, Come on, pretty much, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a proper stuff. Dan, we have ways of making you talk. Yes, well, Dan is the person on the chat who know, who can, um, how do I put this? Is the person in the chat who knows the mo who, who, how do I put it? Uh, whereas I can hide behind things and go, look at books if I want to change topics. He's in the chat. Signing on the office chair, that sounds like an OSHA violation and possibly another twist, a tweet angle. Yeah. Bring <laughs> content this channel's named for Chair Radio. D class by Paul Kemp is worth finding. Um but now I have a good there is a good one. There is a really good one. Um And now I'm annoyed I can't find it. Oh, 
I'm currently writing a boat on a book on the U class. Ah yes. The Fighting Tenth The Tenth Submarine Flotilla and the Siege of Malta by John Wingate. Um, that actually looks like it's free on Kindle, but it's it's it worthwhile getting in a proper copy. Um, Goodness gracious me, how many people have already voted? There are 30 votes already. I haven't voted. And the Royal Navy during the Interregnum is an early lead. Ooh, that'll be a fun one. But also, that's on four. Number three is Michael66. And Danny Wright's also Italian Force Structure is also on free. That and one five nine. Hey, Karamba. Search for Stafford, find car. Ooh. Yeah, found it. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And very happy doggos. Hello, Mike Newman. So, well, you got a few comments coming in. Mmm, bacon, yes. But, now, today's been an interesting day as far as naval history goes. And we've got some interesting stuff coming up. Uh, one of the things I will say that's coming up, and I will get a source quickly up so I can explain it. Let's go for settings. Add in new history live, and I'm looking for steam rate, steam rate, steam rate. Then that will allow me to explain it. So, I'm going to be uh, setting these all up shortly. But, if I move this back to the position where it was again quickly. Uh, we have, coming up this week, we have the Revolutionary Battles, Battle of Rice Boats and Battle of San Nicolas. 
We have then Brew Ships 105, Patron 74, Brew Ships 106, Patron 75. The Battle of Yemen, which, as I've said, is now longer, no longer going to be alive for my own safety as it's Mothering Sunday. It is going to be a recorded video. I'm sorry, but um, I like my skin attached to my body, not boiled off it. I haven't yet decided on the 30th of March the Patron bonus, but I'm going through the various Patron choices uh, various patron suggestions over the last year or so and looking at them and deciding what I like. I am to an extent waiting for the um, vote to come in because it might be I might go for one of the repeats which has gone uh, which has come quite a lot just because that's there. Then in April I'm off to do some Justin Craiging for a bit. So between the 2nd and 8th and 30th of April you will get the Key Ships Series 1. And well, that will also be on the 30th of April because I'm off again for a little bit of Justin, uh, Justin Craigie. And then the f June, you've got sort of you've got March, April, May, June. June we've got the glorious first of June, and then we've got the Shear ships two and other specials. Now June is at current. If everything goes to plan and everything works as it's supposed to, it's going to be slightly different. I'm going to announce this now, and I'm doing this at this point in life because it's about an hour in. I do know some people will be watching who will go, well, why are you doing admin now? You should do it at the end of the stream. Because I want people to start thinking about what's going to come up. So June, if things go to plan, I'll be wandering around for a lot of June. So I won't be able to do lives. At least not on the regular basis normally doing because I'm going to be moving a lot of hotels so what I've come with the idea of doing is I'm going to announce in April alongside the April um, when we're doing the April vote the vote for the selections for April there's going to be a suggestion for vote for your June and the top four are going to get made into long patrols, into recorded videos. So that's what's going to happen with June. Okay? So that's a head up what's going to happen in June. June, it's going to be instead of a live and a recorded video and a live and a, a two lives and two recorded videos based on those topics, it'll be four topics, all recorded videos. Does the British publication name matters, at least before we want to call the fleet? Is this available online anywhere? Ooh, I've done a bit of searching for it. I haven't ever actually come across a decent copy of it. Online. I hope my car situation is sorted soon, but at the moment I have, at the moment I have the budget I have the, of the of the budget I have, and frankly, I'm looking at the cars, and they are about the cars which I normally buy in terms of mileage and quality seem to be about twice the price I normally pay for them at the moment. See, Clark, Alex. In my opinion, isn't. It is in my opinion that it would have been better for the Stuart dynasty if James had gone down with HMS Gloucester, which was in '65, which was in the news that they found the wreck in 2002. It would certainly have been interesting if James II had. Mm. It would have been very interesting. Discord. Can you do the Battle of Yemen as a premiere so we can talk to each other while they're watching? Yeah, I'm happy to set it up so it's a premiere. Yeah. What changes do the to the RN do you see the members of the UK Commonwealth superpower other than more manpower bringing? Ooh, it's going to be an interesting movement of where the ships are based. Plus an easier case to make for funding. Alright, so... 
this is the next four months, really, coming. It's always funny to think like that. You sometimes feel, and this is going to sound strange, when you're scheduling like this and you're talking about this, sort of, you are almost wishing your life away because you're talking about all these things coming up. And we've got the Chilean Civil War and the sinking of the Blanco Enchilada in the 20, on 23rd of April. We've got the Battle of Hakadote in the 4th of May. We've got Gun for Lunchens in the 25th of May. We've got all sorts of thing, fun things going on. Everyone, I'm extremely tempted to ask to get random live stream discussions about sci-fi, given who is likely to be on that trip. Mm-hmm. This could be interesting. Encalada. Encalada. Not enchilada. Enclada. Sorry, I keep mispronouncing it. Any books today? Yes, I've got six of them. You know, I have trouble planning a week or so in advance. I have to plan for this and for the channel as a whole. I plan for a full year and a half. I have every week scheduled out for about a year in advance. And I have blocked out in terms of topics. As I've said before, every year till 2030. So I have blocked out every year... Till I am forty three. It uh, basically, I uh, my blocking runs out in December, uh, December twenty thirty, at the moment. I don't know what was the point of the combined steam and gas concept. Trying to get the best of both worlds, which isn't at all unusual for uh, for navies or power supply scenarios. <laughs> very nice, Melanie. I'm very glad you found them at your local store. Although, now that Melanie is uh, fueled by Iron Brew, she might be even more of a capable, uh, even more of a super admin than she already is. I don't know. So, I think the first book today, if I remember correctly, is this one. So let's do this. And do Swivel. Hello, we move. And then this. So, you have possibly seen this book before, because I'm nicest way, I've had about five of the copies of this in the last couple of years since COVID has cleared up. Because I buy it, and then friends slash colleagues nick it. The two of you at King's who have nicked my two, my two of my previous copies, you both know who you are. I expect lunches. As I don't, I doubt I'm getting them back by this point. All right. It's the 1897 the naval naval annual, and it's a really cool book to have because it gives you a good starting off point for one uh, for starting off looking at the pre dreadnought period and the dreadnought period. Johnny and Kay, saw you in a couple of episodes of War Factory. Sounds like it. Yes, it was me. I'm hoping I'm back in the next series as well. That's going to be. That was a fun one to. That was. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. They were really nice people to work with. <laughs> so. 
Now, why is the 1897 so good? Because it's it's pretty much the earliest version you can get reprinted like this. And you always have to remember, this section, this first part, is articles, right? So this part's articles. Then this is part two. And part two is tables. Tables of ships under construction, tables of ships in service, tables of ships. The entirety of fleets of every nation that so has a fleet is listed here. Up to and including torpedo boats and little extra vessels. So that's that section. And then from this section onwards, you have drawings of the ships. Annotated, beautiful drawings of the ships. With their armour listed, their class types, and their roles. And you've all seen the drawings I've used over the years. I, always, I nick the drawings, I stick them up on the slides, and I use them shamelessly. Especially when I have my decent scanner. We have some very interesting ships here. This, of course, is the earlier hood. We're always talking about the battle cruiser from the end of World War One. Well, this is the earlier vessel. This is hood as it was in 1897. Turreted ship with redoubts. The track is live too. Cool. Awful. And these make up another. huge chunk of the book, this book. This section. And then you get this. And this is a section on armour and ordnance in that period. And all the weapon uh, guns and all their stats. And the various new Elwick guns, etc. All the breaches. All these details going on. And then you get tables of ordnance. Literally, just tables of guns. So when I say this gun is th this point, and this gun is at this point, and this gun is available on this time, I'm usually basing it on the progress in these sorts of details. These tables. Then we have programs of repairs, shipbuilding, even some nice charts about the construction of ships overall. It's a full guide to what is going on in the world in 1897 as far as naval affairs is concerned. So what was Metropolitan Vickers, one of the earlier variants of Vickers? So, this is a really good book, and it's written very well, too. For example, and... I might well turn 
this on so I have slightly more light to read in. But oh my lord, will I be lit up. This is what happens when you choose a light for its energy efficiency rather than necessarily its, its natural look of, oh, I look bathed in it. Look at me, I'm radiant. Radiant. Anyway. The arrogant class have two submerged tubes. Considering their displacement, they are lamentably weak in armament, and the speed is inferior to that of their predecessors in the British Navy, as well as to that of the most modern cruisers. Coal supply given into the table, for example, uh, for all except to the Buenos Aires, is coal carried at low, dr a low draft. But there is no doubt that the bunker capacity of the Arrogant is at least a thousand tons. The Ellswick cruisers, Yoshira and Buenos Aires, which are considerably small in the Arrogant, carry as powerful an armament and have a speed of 23 knots. Speed is one of the principal requisites of for a cruiser. Provided the gunpowder is not altogether sacrificed to it, as is the case in the Columbia and Minneapolis. The Arrogant is expected to be ready for sea in the summer. The third class cruiser, Porcupine, uh, Porcupine, laid down on the 2nd of March, 1896, since the ship to the Pelorus, was launched on the 5th of December and is completing its Sheerness dock. The propelling machinery is being made at Keyham. Um, she'll be fitted with a triple expansion engines and water tube boilers. A considerable number of ships have been laid down during the past year. In the last number of the naval, last number of the naval annual, we urge that, in view of construction going on abroad, a new program of battleship construction must be taken in hand. Five battleships have been laid down d during the year 1896-97, and it is proposed to lay down four more battleships during the year 1897-98. The Canopus, which gives her name to the class, and the Goliath were laid down on 4th January 1897 at Portsmouth for Chatham, respectfully. The former will be engineer engined by the Greenock Foundry Company, the latter was by Messrs. Penn. The Glory is being built and engined by Messrs. Laird Burst, Laird Bros, I eat Camel Lairds. Uh, the Ocean, building at Devonport, is to be engined at, by Hawthorne, Leslie & Co. And the Thames Ironworks are building the Albion, for which Messrs. Maudsley, Sons and Field will undertake the engines. The following table shows the dimensions of the Canopus class are compared with those of the Majestic class and the Renown. And then it's a nice table. And what I always like about these books is next to, they have the old style system where next to this point, you have, and next to the text, they have little phrases. Really fun and really good to read. Take care, Amelia. So I've got grandfather worked at Mentor Vickers before Trafford Park in what we'll do. Mm. Julian, watching from the beginning at 1.75 spe times speed. Currently look locked out of voting for patron topics because my patron membership is currently expired due to shortage of funds. Don't worry. Andrew Cruz, when, why did guns disappear from merchant shipping? Priority never really did. Uh, went away, did it? Um, by the point at which you can rely on Royal Navy ships, and usually it was Royal Navy ships to be nearby and to come when you needed them, that's when piracy sort of disappears. As for it disappearing, well, it sort of got further and further away. Out of that, you've got the size of the ships and their general speed. And it gets to the point at which if you're going through some areas, the pirate ships can't keep up because they're sail ships. And they can't get up to you. And if you've got someone following you, you can radio and warships appeared.
Rudon, I survived Drax Patron Dry Dock and all I see are torpedo boats. I think the most interesting thing would be if someone managed to watch both of Drax Dry Docks in a day. And my Twitch, uh, Twitch stream on a Sunday. And my live and his live in all in the same day, in the same run. I have a feeling after that many hours of naval history conversation and strategic thinking and discussions, you would probably feel you'd co completed the learning requirements for an entire week of a university course. Yeah, I do tell them they can go and buy their own copy. But, you know, it would be, it'd be nice if they did actually buy their own copy occasionally. Just working out the discussion time this evening. Yeah, I think tonight is going to be long enough for everyone to be happy. Hannah Jack Ray. Andrew, so maybe it was radio that killed the ocean and ocean power tra trade, pretty much. All right, I've done that. It's fine. I put the dry docks on loop anyway. <laughs> how much the book does we make? Um, let's see. How much did my copy today cost? Uh, well, there's this one. Uh, I think it's about twenty pounds. It's they're not much. It's more a case of the hassle of keep having to order it because it keeps getting nicked. Uh, da -da 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 -da. £16.50. I'll put a link in the description. That's it. I am listening to you and Drac while watching a Blue Archive live stream. Good lord. Run on. I have an opportunity to do that in June. However, my road trip partner may reach, uh, might reach over and follow me on the interstate. 
you you could always try and get them hooked before they you know before you go so they that they're in keen on it as well. In a UK Commonwealth superpower, would it be reasonable that every UK Commonwealth military members would adopt a big expensive kit? Yes. Don't expect everyone to be operating carriers. Don't expect everyone to be operating cruisers and destroyers. Most will probably be operating frigates. There will probably be two types of frigates. And their actual frigate force balance will depend on their finances. So they might go for a small number of all first rates. Or they might go uh, first top of line frigates. Or they might go for... A large number of second uh, of the second line frigates and a few uh, a few uh, a few of the first line frigates. Okay, Karen. Thank you for all your hard work, Doctor Clock. I especially enjoyed listening, watching you on uh, your drag while I'm playing UAD. Hmm. I think I scared a small German. Um, Twitch streamer today because they were doing UAD and I was flicking through and they were just, it wasn't in English but it was UAD and they would look at the ship they were designing looked pretty darn good and I know you're supposed to raid and tell people uh, give people so people can go off elsewhere in Twitch and I never done it before and I thought well you know I'll do it and so they went from having three to having twelve subscribe twelve viewers very quickly. Which shows you just how many people I had watching my, my Twitch stream. Just long. Don't start. Honestly, I have to pause and cut both viewers under acts longer videos into more manageable sizes. Otherwise, things start to blend into each other. Give me some time to let things sink in. Hmm. That's what. Once the losses outweigh the positives, the Rene was sent in to burn out the pirate ports. Pretty much what I'm doing in in Empire Total War right now, burning out the pirate ports. Well, he's joining me on this adventure, knowing full well that I'll be uh, spending multiple days crawling over U.S. and RCN museum ships between North uh, New Jersey and Canada. Good luck. Malaga, his reaction was amusing. <laughs> Since when have you been doing Twitch stream? And why have you not mentioned this to me? I've been doing... That's where the Twitch stream videos that go up on Monday and Wednesday come from. I've been doing Twitch streams for a while because... As I said when I started it, I needed a backup in case anything happened to YouTube. If anything happened to YouTube, and it's, it's, this is going to sound strange, but... Once you realise that... And I know I've, I've said this sort of before, and I, I, I'm completely honest about this because of the state of academia. Um, I love it. I love teaching students. But the least reliable income streams I have are the university teaching. Be, not because of the hours. The hours are reliable. The hours I'm going to do. be required to teach. I can almost recite in my sleep and recite the topics in my sleep. No, it's actually them remembering to pay me. And um, then pay me the correct amounts. And I, lo I, I, I love them dearly, but they just, they are, uh, the, the universities are a bit um, interesting when it comes to the whole remembering to pay their staff scenario. And so YouTube and Patreon have become absolutely critical for me. And this then leads to a scenario whereby what happens if YouTube decides to have issues? What do I have as a backup option? I have nothing as a backup option. Okay. That's not sensible. That's not sustainable to not have a backup option. There is no scenario where being dependent upon just one medium, one system... To get something to do something is a sensible scenario. Always have a backup option. Unless it's something which completely doesn't bother you, then only have one, it's fine. But, you know, I have a Kindle reader and Kindle on my phone. I have multiple backups for most of these scenarios. 
why wasn't I having a backup for YouTube? So, I looked around. And so I'm one of the few people who does live streams and recorded videos who's actually gone the other way. In that I'm still doing YouTube, but I've set up Twitch as well. That's a good and that's the backup. Um, does it f feel fitting that Hood had not, uh, had she not died, an architect dies in the very part of the UK where she was born 20 plus years earlier? It would feel pr pretty nice. That's what. Given how determined universities are to wring money out of the out of people, are we uh, students? Are we sure they aren't actually? Um, you have to remember, universities always have more of these plans on how to spend money before they make money. They're not like a co company; they are always looking at their expenses before they look at their income. So they're always looking to try and make their income match their expenses. And their only part of their income they can really control, that they can really control, are their student fees and income. And even that in the UK they can't really control because the government sets limits. And we know those fees don't cover the real costs of the teaching. We know they don't. So... They're in a catch-22 permanently. And the large universities that have endowments, that have better fundraising organizations, that are able to use their very luscious and wonderful buildings to rent out for special occasions and make all sorts of income in other scenarios, they are a level above the universities which most of my employment is with. Because whilst I go and work for a couple of universities like that, those universities never have any problem with paying me, never have any issues. But the universities of the row below want to spend like they're the big universities, but don't make money like they're the big universities. Oh, we are unionized, but the trouble is, I'm a contract lecturer. So I'm neither fish nor fowl. You learn it very quickly. And mm, the union, uh, because I would have to be at a different union in almost every different university I work in, because they're not the same ones, I don't fancy paying that much in union dues. Because it's all the minimum rate, and he goes, no. Yeah, most universities pay their vice chancellors a very healthy salary. But then you look at the size of the budget they're running, and you realise what you're competing against. the next video next, well not the next video next book this one sorry just heard something fall over <sighs> better go deal with it before my sister rushes out in the cold oh, I've got a sister who is featuring uh, uh, who is teetering on the edge of making herself ill keep going out in the cold 
It's brilliant. Hang on, no keys. I've locked myself in. There we go. Maybe it's a fluffy research assistant coming for a visit. Or the water building. Or the feral research assistant coming for a visit. It was the dog uh, dog gate. We have one of those dog fences you stick across your garden to try and protect your um, garden from basically getting dug up at certain points. Because, you know, we have two excavators. When I say excavators, I mean we have two... How do I put this politely? Two uh, fluffy gentlemen who consider that they should be... Um, redesigning the level of the ground and adding extra transportation methods and rapid transit of their own devising between certain key critical points. I think one of them is currently digging for Australia. But leaving that to one side, um, to protect the newly put in plants, this metal fence has been put, or this sort of pre-fabricated sort of fabricated sort of fence pen that can be put into a sort of pen, but we've got it strung out across the long garden. How's it been put up? Anyway, the gate part of it keeps falling down. The rest of it stays standing, but the gate part keeps falling down, because the gate is supposed to be locked in at, on the one side to the pen, to the other side, to the other, the pen at the other end. So, um, I'm going to have to figure that one out tomorrow. I'm going to have to. No, I'm twitching. Mm hmm. Leaving that to one side, drink. Yeah. You're not the only one who should be drinking. I do know there, there did used to be a drinking game, I know, set up for these videos. I'm not sure if it's still being played and if it's still current. If it is. And if you don't, if you've got it as a board, I will happily put it up in the Discord. As long as you don't mind, I will label it the Iron Brew drinking game, because, of course, I'm encouraging cousins to drink Iron Brew, uh, not um, anyone to drink, uh, uh, not the in, in the imbibation of, uh, imbibation of um, alcoholic beverages, because, of course, YouTube doesn't like that. And, frankly, as a, not, as a non-drinker myself, it would seem rather um, two-faced to encourage others to do what I do not do. Steve Clark, if the dog if the dog gets deep enough, think of all the free geothermal energy. Look, don't take us the wrong way, but um, I was recording something Friday, and I came out, and the dogs had been in the garden while I'd been recording, and I hadn't been watching them. My, it was my sister's job. She'd let them out, but oh no, they're fun. They're having fun playing. And I came out after I finished recording, so you know, it's usually about 75, 90 minutes for me to record a video. I kid you not, Zebedee was at the point at which I could just about see his tail and the corgi butt above the ground level, 
and he was and um yeah he was going for it I'm assuming they ended up saying all three men the unexpired life of their contracts plus the replacements they brought in. You know, life gets expensive. So the single shaft is just a cost cutter measure. Depends what time period you're talking about. If you're talking about in the beginning, early days of steam, most ships were single shaft. But once you get to modern navies, etc. You tend to want to go for a multiple shaft scenario. It gives you survivability. That's what I think the students' issues with the salary was that they decided to stop funding cheaper commuting for the students as unaffordable while funding the VC to commute from Sweden. Well, you see. The VC is actually useful to university. The students just get in the way. And I kid you not, there are universities I've worked at where it wasn't like that. So, next book. Just, uh, Joshua Levine's Dunkirk and Operation Fortitude. Two histories uh, that ch missions that changed the fate of World War II. Operation Fortitude is the interesting one. And basically, this book is what I would consider two books. He wrote two rather long sections, and this is what could happen with my Kindle books. Because they these books are both like this. Right? And that's one of the reasons I want, to, I want to do this. They're both roughly 45,000 words long. Okay. What is done is gone. Right, and that's not long enough for a printed book. But I can turn it into a printed book and just combine it together. While the four men in a boat were making a hapless stand at spying in Kent, at spying in Kent, or as the jury believed in the case of Sir Trapons, waiting for an opportunity to surrender, two men, a Swede and a Dane, were preparing to drop into Britain by parachute. Gusta Caroli, the Swede, was a 27-year-old mechanic with, in the words of his adware dossier, clear, laughing eyes and inspired confidence. 26-year-old was Wolf Schmidt, a slim, dark, blonde-haired Danish army veteran who had recently spent time working as a fruit exporter in the Camerons. They had been discovered by Walter Pretorius. They were enthusiastic Nazis, and they spoke good English. Nikolaus Ritter spoke plainly with them from the beginning. Let's not play games with each other, he told them. You know that you're putting your life in the balance, and that after you land, you're completely on your own. The men were lodged in adjoining rooms of the Phoenix Hotel in Hamburg, while they received a much more thorough training than Pons. Waldberg and friends were given in parcels. They were taught Morse, ciphers, meteorology, aircraft and weapons recognition, and camouflage. An Amboy man, known as Bruns, explained to them that their primary role would be to report back on the details of aerodromes, uh, aerodromes and aircraft. They would also be expected to keep the Amboy informed about troop movements, national morale, factory production, and the British weather. Calorie Schmidt quickly struck up a close friendship, intensified by the prospect of shared danger. They made swift progress and impressed Ritter, who considered them the cream of his protégés. Once their training was complete, they were driven to Brussels to receive wireless sets and provisions for their respective missions. But they could not set off immediately. The weather had, be, had to be right. It was too, if it was too clear, their arrival would be obvious. If it was too unsettled, the parachute drop would be hazardous. During the day, Caroli became close to a young woman. Concerned about the extent of his agent's pillow talk, Ritter had the woman taken into protective custody while Caroli and Schmidt were taken to Paris. They stayed on Avenue de la Opera and visited the Abwehr's French headquarters in the Hotel Luteria. While there, Caroli signed a contract with, uh, which stated that once his mission was complete, he would be entitled to four years of schooling in Germany or the cash equivalent. Schmidt was not offered a contract, but promised work in the colonies and a sum of money. They were taken to La Sphinx, a Paris brothel reserved for German officers. The refreshed team returned to Brussels and prepared for work. Caroli was the first to go. He travelled west to Rennes, 
Well, his transmitter struck to his chest. He shook with his hand and boarded a black Hankel at a triple one. The converted bomber flew across the channel before being caught in a searchlight's beam as it crossed the English coast. The pilot turned back and so that same night, Caroline was returned to Brussels. Another attempt was made late on the 5th September. In the early hours of the morning, after a long and draining wait, Caroline finally found himself falling towards England. Unfortunately for him, MI5 was waiting his arrival. The double cross system was showing its benefits. Arthur Owens had been informed that another spy was shortly to enter Britain. Snow is in daily contact with the Germans, writes Guy Little in his daily diary on the 27th of August. Arrangements are being made to land an agent by parachute. The great difficulty is to get the man down alive and prevent the local defence volunteers from getting at him. Anyway, Carol Lee landed near Denton in Northamptonshire. During his descent, the wireless set, strapped to his chest, struck him on the chin, knocking him unconscious. He was out cold for several hours, and when he came to, he picked up his equipment, staggered into a ditch, and passed out again. This meant that he missed his first original transmission to Hansburg. In the afternoon, a farmhand spotted his feet, poking out from underneath a brush. He told the farmer what he had seen, and with another two men, they went to investigate. They found the day's Caroli, who had told them that he arrived the previous night by parachute and shown them his pistol and a wallet full of English money. He admitted that he was a Jones spy and was handed over to police, but only after a delay was MI5 informed of this arrival. Tar Robertson quickly arranged for him to be taken to Cannon Road Police Station in London. From there, he was sent to Campo 20. And so, in the early afternoon of 7th September... While Nicholas Ritter was anxiously calling the Hamburg radio station to ask whether Agent 3275 had, had yet made contact, 3275 was already being interrogated by Tinai Stevens. By now being decided that the four men in a boat would not be used as double agents, but Stevens had high hopes for Caroli. So long as he hadn't yet communicated with Hamburg, did you send any message? Stevens barked. No, Caroli replied. That's a lie. What is this message? said the command. Po pointing a piece of paper found on Caroli. I was going to send it at night time, he said, replied. So the time of sending was passed? Yes. Were you arrested before the next time sending? Yes. So you couldn't send it? Yes. The first double agent test seemed to be satisfied, but Curly was not broken easily. He freely confessed that he was a spy, but admitted little else apart from the fact that the Germans expected him to report on bond damage in Birmingham, Oxford, Nottingham, and Northampton Triangle. He stubbornly refused to betray his oath. I liked Germany so much, he explained. I have German blood. You know you are likely to be shot, said R. Stevens. Yes. You still intend to keep your oath? Yes. Just consider this very carefully, bluffed the commandant. We have 99% of this whole th of the whole thing for understanding. The little more necessary we shall discover in a few hours or days. If you tell the rest of it now, we shall be saved the trouble. Is it worth flinging your life away so that we shall have a few extra hours work? Yes, said Caroli. Stevens continued working relentlessly on his prey. At one point, Caroli revealed that another agent was due to arrive shortly, and that he was very friendly with this man. It occurred to Stevens that while Caroli might not be willing to cooperate to save his own life, he might do so to save the life of his friend. Stevens promised to spare the life of his friend of yours in return for Caroli revealing everything he knew about his contract and his uh, contacts and his mission. Sweet so agreed to the bargain. Nicholas Ritter had been made a grave mistake in allowing his spies to become intimate friends during their training process. Once the deal was done, Caroli began talking freely. He gave Walt Schmidt's name and described him. He explained approximately where he would be dropped and described the equipment he would bring with him. And he told Stevens something that, that even Ritter didn't know. The two spies had made an agreement to meet on 20th September outside the Black Boy Pump in uh, Northampton. On Coroli went, giving Stevens information that a little while earlier he had been prepared to die for sooner than reveal. All the same, Coroli initially refused to work as a double agent when the proposal was made to him. He had already betrayed his master by giving information. This seemed the betrayal too far. But he was eventually persuaded that the Germans had brought him to England, ill-equipped and under false pretenses. And so, given the co-name Summer, Caroli agreed to become a double agent. This meant that MI5 had a valuable new man, distinct from the ring of agents that had developed around our thrones. It meant that Ritter would finally receive news from a prize agent. And it meant that Tin I Stevens' interrogation strategies were paying off. For the first and last time in history of Camp 020, writes Stevens, a promise was made to a prisoner. And upon that promise devolved many of the most spectacular wartime secret successes of British Canadian Spinage services. Caroli left camp on 020 on 9th September and sent his first successfully controlled wireless message to Hamburg several days later. His transmitter was initially set up in a field near Aylesbury, where Caroli lay, lay tapping out prepared messages under close scrutiny of a radio operator who ensured that he never wandered off script. But the transmissions failed until the wireless set was moved to higher ground, inside the local police station. When he eventually made contact with Hamburg, Curley explained a week-long delay by saying that he had been injured on descent and was currently hiding in the fields near Oxford. He now intended, he said, to make his way to London, posing as a refugee. The mere result was unexpected, but gratifying for Tara Olsen and Emma Five. On receiving the message, Ritter decided to call on Owens for help and sent a message which read, Swedish friend in fields near Oxford. How can he contact you at once? 
Owens was clearly still trusted by his German spymasters, and Mama 5 was given an early indication of its level of control of, over the Abwehr's operations. But as Robertson pondered his next move, he was aware of the delicacy of the situation. A mistake now could blow both Owens and Caroli, and Caroli was the potential forerunner for an entire battalion double agents. After a discussion with Guy Little, Robertson instructed Owens' radio operator to send a message suggesting that Owens should meet the Swedish friend at High Wycombe railway station. Robertson decided that the meeting must really take place in case the Germans had anybody watching. But as Robertson now had doubts about Owens and didn't want him knowing too much about Caroli's true situation, he decided not to send Owens to the meeting. He instead sent Sam McCarthy, Biscuit, the sub-agent who had recently met Ritter in Portugal. And so, MI5 double agents, Summer and Biscuit, acted out of the rendezvous as though they were genuine German spies. The Germans had nobody watching, but MI5 had, just in case Caroli decided to make a bolt for freedom. On this occasion, he did as he was told. The two men walked together for a while in the direction of London. McCarthy, who had a problem with drink, was instructed not to stop in any pubs as they went. After a time they parted, Robertson decided that the Germans should now be sent a message asking whether they would allow Caroli to spend the winter at McCarthy's house. After all, it now looked as though the invasion wasn't coming, and Caroli needed a roof of his head. Ritter agreed. Thanks for helping, uh, to, uh, help for, uh, for help to friend. Won't forget, he radio owned two days later. B1A was playing its hand extremely well. There you go. Dunkirk and Operation Fortitude. Now I kind of want to make a Corgi Pattern Termite for my Space Marine Army. Uh, <laughs> it works. Uh, Colin Cameron, did you, uh, Doc, have you tried the air up water bottle? You get a flavour from the smell, but nothing added to the water. No iron brew, unfortunately. Mm, not really, no. Well, you have to remember, Jack Ray, that actually, for quite a lot of universities, the money's not in the students, the money's in the research. In fact... If you consider most of the students, as I've said before, in the UK, um, there is an honour system that some courses, the actual students cost more money than the fees bring in. So, you might on a history course or a war studies course, you might just about break even. On an engineering and science and definitely medical course, the fees do not cover they don't go they don't they're limited by government and they don't go far enough George Newman, sorry to hear about your troubles buying a car so I, I just sold my third car this week I, I do there is a nice uh, there are, there have been a few nice people who messaged me who uh, see the channel and have sent going oh check out our things you know we'll do you a good deal sort of thing and I have looked at the, their fi their things and it's probably they're usually very good dealers, and I look at their cars, and the cars I would really like of theirs are the really expensive ones, which are definitely out of my price range. Nan Freeman, see Terry Pratchett in the Unseen University for a fairly realistic representation of the British University system. Sadly, definitely. So you got question. Alex, do you think Admiral Canaris was an allied agent? I've done a video on Canaris. I have a lot of respect for Canaris. I don't think he was a double agent, but I think he was an agent for Germany, not the Third Reich. And I think there is only one scenario where he plays things straight for personal gain. And I'm not sure what he tells Franco. But as happened with Franco, Franco... Um, Franco didn't enter the war on Germany's side. And more importantly, perhaps, than that, didn't, uh, then after the war, provides Canaris' wife. And Canaris is one of the few who actually seems to be loyal to his wife in the German high command. Um with a pension and looks after and take, invites her to Spain and takes care of her.
No, they need to get to the transmitter to the top of least building so it can work properly. Well, you know, there's advantages to that. It's in a secure location. Um, not sure, really. I think it was Operation oh, what was the, the one before Fortitude, and I'm treating as a real question because it was it was actually quite an interestingly named operation, but I cannot remember for the life of me. Good luck, Jacob. And look, I think we call them adjunct professors in the States. No tenure of wise protectors and minimal salaries. Woohoo! Yep. Mm. The bursar was fairly reliable as a pay as a paymaster. Um, right then, I think the next one is... Is it Volkanov or is it Absolute War? It's absolute war. It's Benry's absolute war, isn't it? Uh. Nice, no, So, would you agree that the privatizations of the 1970s and 80s that the UK could have done uh, could have been far done far better than they were? With hindsight, certainly. With foresight, no one really was sure what they were doing or what they were, how they were going to do it. It's one of those things that... <sighs> Privatisation is a sensible route to go. Because it can provide access to a lot of capital, which otherwise the government would be it would be part of the national debt and this is the problem we see in some countries at the moment especially some major ones in that you have the debt spread around however there are issues with that there are issues with all of this in that if you if you focus too much on one thing you're going to run into trouble on another and thing you run into in the debt scenario and in the financial scenario is that if you have the fun if you're privatizing company uh, privatizing national companies you have to make them into you have to be able to change you have to actually make them into a company you can't just rebrand them as a private company and sell them to start running because like they do, they're probably going to get quickly swallowed up by uh, by other companies who are going to turn them into cash cows, and that's a real problem for you if those are essential utility companies. That you they are cash cows to an extent, but you don't want them to be operators if they're cash cows. They've got to be invested in, and that's the trouble for Britain. The way it was done didn't set those companies up on a path of success. It set them up on a path to becoming someone else's cash cow. Noon. The rankings here are some professors emeritus, retired, professors full time, associate professors part time, full to part time, and adjunct professors part time and instructors to no doctorate. Yep, I've been adjunct. Occasionally, possibly even an associate, depending on some departments. Not sure why it's buffering.
It's really fun once I had that light on. I've got to bring a lead, reading light down here, haven't I? For when I'm reading, so I don't have to use that light. I'll have to get one of my, my bar light down here at some point. Rafa Rizzo, yeah, I'm late. We had to go look at Legos. There is nothing wrong with having to go look at Legos. That is the problem with selling off those systems. Especially when they get bought by... Um, well, if you consider in the UK, we have the curious scenario of foreign government-owned utility companies bought our utility companies and then... Put, ran up debt on them, on the British utility companies, to pay for investments in their utility, their in their essential development. So they didn't, because they couldn't run up debt on their own, in their own country, on the on the sort of because they were government owned, and it's it's sorted out now. It, it's not a continual thing, but it was an interesting scenario when it happened. I think it only happened in one or two cases, but. Yeah, I remember having interesting discussions with people about it, going, what the... Heck? that doesn't make sense. There are often these issues. You know, there is a problem when governments do things for a first time. There is a problem when governments do things for a second time often, and usually about about, about the fifth or sixth time they get it right. Um, there was an interesting discussion today on Crusader Kings 3, and it was Gareth Stream. And he pointed out that Crusader 3 is a generational game. It's not an empire game, it's a generational game. It's about building your dynasty your family up to the point at which they rule the mighty empire. It's not you building yourself up to rule an empire as quickly as possible. It's building up your family. So you can afford to take the long-term approach. In other words, it's all about building and preserving upon institutional and familial, familial institutional memory. And the growth of knowledge and growth of understanding. It's a really good way to look at it. But... There is an issue, and it's a sensible issue, but it's an issue. When we look at Britain and most of the successful nations in their various golden ages, they have a deep, a deep, deep foundation of civil service and bureaucracy that remember has the institutional memory and remembers things like the lessons it's learnt. And I think part of the trouble we have today is along with those privatizations, you lost a lot of that institutional memory because those organizations were actually part of the civil service and did have civil servants in them. But combined with the legacy of the World War Two, uh, World Wars, and loss of people then, and the people who then died afterwards, etc., without successors who they'd spent years training up instead of people who they had quickly passed on memory, and especially the, then in vogues of the new management techniques and systems that came in in the nineteen eighties, which didn't, which valued everything new, which valued everything shiny, and placed no, placed absolutely. No value on things which are old. You sort of go, hmm. Okay. All right. I see what happened here. All 
all these things are lost. All this stuff is lost. All this knowledge, all these ideas, all these thoughts, all this memory is lost. And that's what we're living with the legacy of today. And it's one of the interesting things is you can gap carriers, you can gap all those things. The big problem is that you lose the is the institutional memory you lose. You know, look at how desperate the Royal Navy got to operate with the U.S. Navy to send personnel off, spend time on U.S. carriers to maintain institutional memory as best they could on how to operate aircraft carriers, so they didn't forget when it came to rebuilding the Queen Elizabeth class in the service. And even then, look at the missteps we've had. You could have done that, you know, if you consider Britain at several points in the 19th century. It's not building large numbers of ships. It just isn't. It doesn't need to. It churn out a lot of steam-powered steam powered, um, ships line, etc. But they don't, they don't, they're not building a huge number of ships for them. And yet... The moment they need to start building up, they build up and they start organizing again. And people go, oh, well, they have the yards, they have the infrastructure. Yes, you can have the yards and infrastructure. But if you don't have the bureaucracy to run that, uh, to make sure that all works, it's not going to work. You know, bureaucracy is this dirty word these days where people go, ah, fat cats, civil servants, and all these things. Most of them are not. The vast majority of them are, better, are not paid a huge amount at all. And they actually do serve a serious purpose because the idea that you can do something without any administration. Well, walk into any company, especially any company which is a haulage company or some kind of warehouse company. And you'll meet lots of people they will call the most important person in the building. But the most important person in the building usually is the management secretary, or equivalent post, sitting in the warehouse office. The one who coordinates the manager, makes sure they know what's going on, and then is the eyes and ears of the managers on the floor, walking around people. And it's the person most people walk up to when they go, I can't remember what I'm technically supposed to be doing. Because if they go to the manager, they're telling their boss they don't know what they're doing. But if they go to the boss's secretary, to the organizational secretary that's fine because they won't fire them they'll just tell them quietly what's going on there are and now imagine doing that for an entire national war effort imagine how many of those people you need quietly running things quietly keeping track of where everything is and where everyone needs to be and what they need to be doing that's what you need and the memory of, and that knowledge and that ability to do it is often built upon having worked in that company for years, sometimes decades. And you think what happens to that company if that person goes without having trained someone up? That person goes suddenly. That's a huge loss to that company. And I know there are some companies who are stupid. That person, let's say gets married, has kids, and the company tries to get rid of them as quickly as possible because they're having kids, you know, so they're now no longer a reliable member of staff. But almost always, when I hear about that, and it has happened to some of my family in America, etc., within a few months, they're getting phone calls from the boss going, will you come back, will you come back? Well, no, because you treated me like... terrible. And the new person can't do the job. Yes, the new person can do the job on paper. They have some qualification on paper. But they haven't managed to spend the time working with them. And they haven't managed to understand what was going on. And so they haven't got the pass on the institutional memory. So the government should afford it through before they did it. Government should you should always think things through before you do them. Hello, Morgan McKenzie. Same thing in the States. A power company was purchased by foreign investors. Used the, uh, the company as a backing to pay the gold, uh, play the gold gas, future, uh, gas futures market. When it went bad, they uh, they asked the state to bail them out. Mm -hmm. How much brown did I miss? We haven't started brown yet. We've got this one first before we get to a brown. Absolute War by Bellamy. This is Soviet Russia in the Second World War. And 
Originally published in 2007. Professor of Military Science, Doctrine and Director of Security Studies Institute, Cranfield University. Chris Bellamy. I'm trying not to make jokes about my experience as well as being more your yes minister the stern of the sh star stern or ship covering than competent in institutional memory. If you remember correctly with yes minister, there is a bit of both going on. There's rather a lot of that, but mostly that's to keep out of the politics. When you look at what's going on in terms of the training of Humphrey and training, uh, training that you know the um, other gen the young uh, the younger civil servant and the various other things, there is a lot of institutional memory going on there. It might not be the institutional memory we like as institutional memory, because most of it's about managing ministers, but that is a large part of the civil servant's job, to manage the minister. Because remember, the minister comes in, and they're there for like a year, sometimes a year, maybe a couple of years, and then they're gone, off to the next ministry. They are there as the figurehead of the ship. It's the, it's the civil servants who are there day in, day out, running it as best they can. I would prefer a scenario where the ministers were left in post a lot longer. I think, I honestly think there should be a scenario where ministers are appointed at the beginning of a term of government, i.e. after an election, and that unless there is found they are grossly incompetent or due to death or resignation or anything, you know, those sort of major things, they should be left in post. I don't think they should be, I don't think they should be, the ministers should be changed at all. I think they should be the senior ministers for that entire term of government. And then the prime, uh, so the prime minister can't change them at a whim or a will. They are left in post to learn their post. And on productions, probably a rather naive question, but then how do you fix things in the UK best world also? So is that our productive production capability, commercial and otherwise, uh, so that we're closer to a state like Germany today? You need to invest. In Britain, you need to invest in infrastructure. You need to find the money to invest in infrastructure. And one of the troubles is that Germany qualifies for martial aid and all sorts of things, and Britain doesn't get the same amount of aid because we were on the winning side, so we weren't as bashed up. And we were trying to be proud and claiming we didn't need the money. Um, you need to be a far more realistic appraisal in about the 1950s of what Britain, where Britain is in the world. That's got the most important question. Uh, the person in the building tends to be the junior secretary, the one who has been there 20 years, the only one who knows how the whole system actually works. Mm-hmm. Minus, the anime series Realistic Hero summoned a uh, man, summoned, uh, summoned to a fancy world. Not, not a fighter, not a man, turns a country around because he's good with bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. So I'm slightly worried that this sounds like my job uh, within HMRC, and I'm afraid of people who, uh, the people who help me. <laughs> That's good. A friend of mine was made redundant from a system admin role. In three months, they were asked to come back. They agreed as a consultant. Get paid ten times as much for now. Yep. That's George, uh, George. Hence why the medical profession is just on change controls. Just funk. Case in point. Dutch government cut spending for in-house engineers. They now hire the same people for independent rates. Ouch. Well, see, probably because they have no anti analysis techniques to quantify this type of knowledge. That is the big problem. Correction, uh, George Newman, correction to something I said recently about the Victory Class Museum ships. SS America Victory, Re Raymond, Richmond, California, operational status unknown. SS Red Oak Victory, Tampa, Florida, or operational SS Lane. Hmm. Victory, Los Angeles, California, operational The Movie Star. That's got senior civil servant's job that used to be the almost entirely managing the ministers. Ensuring the minister's latest bright idea doesn't ruin everything. 
Very politicised now, though. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been an arms race where one side publicly acknowledged defeat? No. Right. So, absolute war. On the 3rd of July, a new Soviet frontier was set up on the River Proof. On that day, Serov, uh, Serov reported that his Operashkinsky groups had arrested a total of 760 people. Under interrogation, as a rule, they admitted they had been recruited by Romanian intelligence. On the 9th of the 3rd of July, Romanian army units blew up road and rail bridges across the Proof in the Kagul, Ka Kagul area on the southern part of the new frontier. During the previous few days, Serov reported large numbers of people had been gathering on the right west bank of the Proof. He said they had been taken there by the Romanian army and now wanted to return to Bessarabia, but that the Roma Romanians were trying to stop them. There was an especially large concentration across the major railway bridge leading to Yassi. On the same day, with a new border installation set up by the NKVD border troops, Marshal Timoshenko, the Commissar for Defence, wrote to Army General Zukov, commanding Southern Front, requesting that they be moved out as soon as possible, replaced by field units of the Red Army. The USSR acquired 44,500 square kilometres of territory and 200,000 people in Bessarabia, and 6,000 square kilometres with 500,000 people in northern Bukovia. Into, that, uh, into the area, which became uh, the Odessa Special Military District, moved 15 infantry, motorised and cavalry divisions, and 7 tank and airborne brigades. However, Stalin's actions had pushed uh, Romania firmly into alliance with Hitler. Creating the Northern Soviet Socialist Republic of the USSR was a fairly lengthy process, which began on the 11th of July. Small Moldovan Autonomous Republic coming part of Ukraine, and the new territories were grafted to it to form the new MSSR, with its capital at Kishinev. Only in November was the border between the new republic and Ukraine finalised. 10,000 families were moved from Ukraine into new territories during the autumn, but as early as August 1940, some 53,356 young men and women had been mobilised and sent to other parts of the Soviet Union. As in the Baltic states, mass dis uh, deportations started in the summer 1941, more than 5,000 Bessarabian families forcibly transported on the night of the 30th of June. The movement of German troops into Finland and Romania was one of the factors which began to sour German-Soviet relations. But although Hitler spoke of spring 1941 attack on the Soviet Union during conference of 31st July 1940, he later colluded with Ribbentrop's plan to engage the Soviet Union with a tripartite pact between Germany, Italy and Japan and turn it into a four-power pact. Ribbentrop wrote to Stalin inviting Molotov to Berlin to discuss possibility, possibly with the, with the possibility with the representatives of Japan and Italy the basis of a policy which would be a practical advantage to all of us. Had such a four-power alliance materialised, Britain and the United States would have been a face of a formidable coalition of Germany, the USSR, Italy dominating Eurasia, while Japan, contiguous to the USSR, would have extended the four-power coalition's reach in the Pacific. There are also plenty of client states, including fascist Spain, Vichy France, and German satellites in southern eastern Europe. It might also have been difficult for Turkey, which remained neutral during the Second World War, to remain outside the ambit of the four-power pact. I think he means orbit of the Four Power Pact, but he's written and bit. In the evening of the 9th of November 1940, a special train left the Battle Russia station in Moscow. Such carriages of Western European type, though running on Russian broad gauge, which was to cause the Germans so many logistic problems next year, carried Molotov and his staff, including Berezov, on his second visit to the West. Berezov had been to Germany in the summer on a visit with the Foreign Trade Commissioner McCohen to discuss shipments of German equipment to the Soviet Union in exchange for critical raw materials, especially oil, grain and manganese. Now they were going to talk about the possibility of a four-power pact to break the British Empire. As a fluent German speaker and trained engineer, Berezov was the ideal person to act as Molotov's interpreter. 12th of November, he met Hitler. Having just conquered France, Hitler was haughty and arrogant. In this respect, he was the complete opposite of Stalin, recalled Berezov who amazed everyone with his opposite of sensible modesty and total lack of the desire to impress. Unlike Hitler, Stalin thought that if his limitless power of a minister subject was evident, there was no need to advertise it. Berezov began to interpret, but Hitler was taken aback by his Berlin accent. Who are you, a German? No, said Berezov. I'm a Russian. After the meeting, Hitler told Molotov he considered Stalin to be a historic personality. I also found myself with the thought that I will also be going down in history. That is why it is natural for two political leaders like us to meet. Please, Mr. Molotov, transmit to Mr. Stalin my greetings and my proposal that we hold a meeting in the not-too-distant future. Molotov passed the message on, and it may have played a part in Stalin's miscalculations about Hitler's intentions, or at any rate, the timing of any attack on the Soviet Union. In fact, the dictators never met. 
The next evening, Molotov and Soviet dipl diplomats were in Ribbentrop's study, slightly smaller than Hitler's, but luxurious, filled with tapestries and old masters, which Beresov surmised might have been recent trophies from France. But that lap shade? Now I wonder. The German foreign minister pulled out a piece of paper with the German government's proposal on it. At that point, an air raid siren sounded. British bombers were heading in the direction. Beresov said the British knew Molotov was in Berlin, which they did, and surmised they had launched a significant air raid to prove they were still capable of fighting and to show the Russians what they could do. Next year, Stalin asked his new ally Churchill why he'd bombed my Varashti, and, and Churchill played along, nodding and saying that a golden opportunity should never be passed up. In fact, according to the Operation Records of Bomber Command, on night of 13th to 14th November, 69 aircraft were ordered to attack the Reichschancellor, which had Hitler's bunker underneath it. The Admiralty, Streicher Station, two power stations and two railway marshalling yards. The British probably did not know exactly where the two foreign ministers would be, and the bombing techniques at the time precluded any form of precision. Although the Berlin targets were therefore military, mil military Judge himself admitted that the another aim was to impress the Russians. We'd heard of the conference beforehand, he wrote, and though not invited to join the discussion, did not wish to be entirely left out of proceedings. Berlin was a very long way for the relatively small two-engine Wellington bombers to go. The following night, the 14th and 15th of November, German bombers tore the heart out of the British city of Coventry, although that raid had been planned well before. With British bombs falling on central Berlin, Ribbentrop, Molotov and their teams headed down to the sumptuously furnished bunker where they discussed what might be done in the event of Britain's imminent defeat. If Britain is defeated, said Molotov, who was not renowned for his sense of humour, why are we sitting in a shelter, and whose bombs are falling so close their explosions can be heard even here? The draft treaty would turn the Pact of the Free into a Pact of Four. The four states, Germany, Italy, Japan and Soviet Union, shared a desire to cooperate and ensure their natural spheres of interest in Europe, Asia and Africa. The treaty would enter into force on signature, like the earlier German Soviet treaties, and would run for ten years. Two secret protocols were appended. On one of them, defined the spheres of interest and allocated the Soviet Union the southern directions towards the Indian Ocean. This harkened back to imperial Russian ambitions of previous country promising to fulfil the long-standing and deep-rooted Russian interest in warm water ports and in India, still part of the British Empire. The second secret, secret protocol dealt with Turkey and replacing the Montreux Convention with a new treaty more favourable to Soviet interests. Fortunately for the Western democracies, it did not happen. You see, I'm not so sure because I think... Honestly, if the Soviet Union joins Germany, yes, that's a big thing. But, what does Germany then do instead of invading Soviet Union? Because we've been over again, Barbarossa doesn't really work out. It's not really a sensible plan. What does Germany do with all those troops? Do they try and get into North Africa? Do they concentrating their bombing campaign on the UK? Well, that might help. That might not. And there's also all the technology and all development which happens in the German army from the experience of the Soviet Union. And let's be honest, the Panther would not have looked like it was without the without the investigations and studying of the T-34. King Tiger certainly wouldn't have. And for Russia, well, the trouble is, if you have Russia involved at this point, then it's hard to see how when Japan's getting nuked, Russia doesn't get nuked as well. Because that's a similar scenario. Do you want to invade Russia? No. We want peace, though. If you're prepared to drop a bomb on a nuclear bomb on Japan to end the war in the Pacific, you drop a nuclear bomb on Russia. And it's just, it's not a good scenario. It's actually a worse scenario for the Soviet Union in some regards. But it might be a better scenario for a democratic Russia afterwards, but we'll never, we'll never know. Gertrude, I'd say that Germany would go through Turkey and the Middle East to attack North Africa, if not attacking. Well, that sounds like a, that's a very nice idea, Derp Squad. But again, how are you going to do that logistically? 
Think about that. If you're going to attack North Africa down that route, for starters, the British are already in Iraq. And by this point, and Iran. They're already there. They've got intelligence. They're going to hear you coming. Japan hasn't done their invasion yet. And hasn't done their operations at this point. So, the British will hear you coming. The British will react. But more importantly, if you've got the Soviet Union joining in, and you've got this four-power alliance forming up, you have just made things even more worrying for the Americans. Because, let's be honest, how many American senators are going to presume that your plans do not end with a man in the high castle style scenario? This one, case in point, the senior civil servants are being politicized. The Treasury Secretary who was sacked because he told Trust in Quiet Time their ideas would be a disaster. To be fair, a large majority of people are telling them their ideas would be a disaster. And the 60 million. Oh, the, we're not giving you a $5 hour raise, but we will hire four people, each at 80% of your salary, to do the job you do after you quit. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Invading England doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Well, for Germany to actually pursue an Operation Barbarossa plan. And they could certainly have the plans. They'd have to build a whole lot more equipment than they have. And if you consider the earlier video book I talked about, how the British had penetrated German intelligence, that would have turned into a slaughter. Morgan McKenzie, make a hard play for the Middle East Oils, too, so England has to go a long way around to India Singapore. We already do have to go a long way around thanks to fighting the Italians in the Mediterranean. So that's not going to change anything. And let's be honest. German logistics is rail logistics, right? Where are there a dearth of railways in the Middle East? You get across Turkey, that's fine. Where are some Bosphorus? Use Turkey for that well. The railways run out. The railways run out. And where are you going to go? That's good. Didn't say it was a good idea. Then again, no, it was Barbarossa. It's an interesting scenario to think about. Just funk. If you consider the amount of discussions I put in the 15 inch guns about Britain looking at not just the German reaction, but the reaction across the Atlantic into the decision making process, you can guarantee. You can guarantee there is a large amount of thought process going on, not just for the war they're fighting, but the potential next war. Well, because it didn't even think of the railway issues, thanks. It's one of the things which plagues German logistics the entire way through World War II. Is their dependence upon railways for their logistics. In fact, they th they fight World War II with the most World War One era logistics policy air systems known to mankind. They're incredibly efficient to refine World War One systems, but they are World War One systems.
Oh, well, nuking Japan was done with knowledge that Japan cannot nuke or even gas London, nor or Washington. Germany, Moscow, 1945. Hmm. Moscow don't have aircraft that can reach that far. Not in 1945. Alright, so look at the difference of third rack supply trucks. You see way too different, many different models and too, far too many French makes. But it doesn't talk about their usage of horses, though. German camel supply chain might have been funny to look at. Certainly been interesting. It would have been interesting. And, yeah, there's... There's a whole lot that goes on in thinking these things through. One of the more interesting analyses you can end up in is looking at these things and going, hmm. What are they talking about? What are they sort of they're pushing through? And there's sometimes it's reading between the lines of their analysis. That's good. I think even a single bomb or two a bomber or two would, would be uh, hard given the massive fighter base and radar sites. Couldn't miniaturize anything useful to V2 years size either. Dunfrim, excellent, Hans. The camel lines have arrived with spare parts for our tanks and cans of fuel. Wait, we have a Panzer 4A23 and these are parts for a 4A24. Useless to us! Yeah, that's German logistics in World War II. Ruan, what's more concerning? A military which is aggressively building up its teeth for its training and supply logistics. Training and supply logistics. You can have all the teeth in the world, but if they can't go far, it doesn't really bother anyone. It's going to bother newspapers. Because again, don't get all about it. And it's one of the things which often comes up with the British Armed Forces. The amount of times we get told, Britain has 200 tanks or this many tanks versus Germany or these countries, which have many more tanks. And you didn't go, how many tank transporters does Britain have? Britain has roughly the same, the same number of, as they have tanks. The other countries have roughly a quarter of their, a quarter per number of tanks. This makes a difference. That's good. Not to mention how utterly compromised the German intellectuals was the British probably know the plan before the German pilots said. Yeah, the British did have a lot of luck when it came to Germany intelligence world war two. Basically, if you consider the intelligence war, and that's why I wanted to talk about that book and pick that one up as a discussion before we got into Bellamy's book. And that discussion is because of the intelligence that's going on and the way the British are are not only the British are not only accessing intelligence coming from the Germans. They are controlling the intelligence the Germans are getting from Britain. And imagine the effect on any invasion of the UK.
you know, sea lion would have been riddled. Sea lion, the British would have probably have fed all the information to the Germans and had them landing exactly where they wanted to land them. And that's not good. So, so how do I question? If the IJN had somehow won the battle and captured Midway, how are they planning to keep it supplied and what utility would they have gotten from it? Um, fairy dust is their probable, re probable scenario. They thought they could run convoys through it and probably, honestly, their supply submarines would have been critical to it. Um... Basically, information acquisition, in, and it's Midway becomes quite an important post in the middle of the ocean that allows them to have a lot of patrol aircraft going out and spotting things. Basically, always when you're looking at these islands, think about it in the pre-satellite world, where you're able to search, and without air-to-air -air refueling, again, of aircraft, you're able to search in spheres around certain spaces. So basically, every time you've got a cir cir you've got an island, draw a circle around that island from its airfield, and that's a patrol radius. And you know, work it out, work out how why uh, how distance that's going to be. Basically, do a third of whatever the flight time, a, fl a third of the flying range of the aircraft, roughly, because they will go out for a third. Fly, uh, patrol for a third and fly back. And that's from that sort of island. Interesting. If the double cross system was pitched as an espionage movie, they would uh, then you think you would think it was too ridiculous to be accurate. Not just most of the German human intelligence in Britain control, but Britain all of it. And at the same time, Britain was doing very successful human intelligence in Germany. See Clark. Alex, another issue for Germany is their confirmation bias issue. See their investigation in the chain home from the Zeppelin flights. Yes, they presumed that chain home were um, anti-ship radar systems. Runan, wasn't there a plan by the home guard to create an oil slick, a slick on landing beaches and then light the slick on fire as landing craft were dropping off their troops? That was just one of many interesting plans which the home guard had. Honestly, the home guard scared... Most of the, um, most of the regular forces. How did Thomas find old? Uh, that, that, that is the interesting problem for the Home Guard. Um, they scare most of the armed forces of Britain. Because they are mostly World War One veterans. Who have a very distinct policy on their fight, the Germans they're fighting. Um, they don't care, they're not getting anywhere near their families, and they will do whatever they think is necessary to stop them getting to their families. Including some things which probably in a different time, post-World War II, after the war's over, and after they've written up the definition of it, be referred to as war crimes. I'm fairly sure that the sheer amount of, car of uh, fuel they wanted to use to burn them alive would qualify as that. I know, I don't think there was a double agent on a plane, the number of American tanks, and they got found out because the numbers were too high for the Germans. Um, they were very careful about that sort of thing.
Yeah, Dad's army makes fun of it, but the the real home guard will. Let's put it this way. As I described Home Guard before, and before I get into this book, which is always a good one to read. Imagine this. You're a veteran of World War One. You've grown up in your area all your life. You know it backwards, forwards, sideways. You know there's a place like the back of your hand. You have all the baggage of World War One in your head. And now you're told the people you fought in World War One, their descendants are coming over here. To UK. To your homeland. And... You've seen what they've done in France, you've heard on the news, etc. You've heard all the atrocities. They're going to be attacking your family. And let's be honest, by World War II, you might well have grandkids. Your son could a son or sons could be off fighting them, and your nephews could be off fighting them. In which case, as far as you're concerned, you are responsible for defending. And this is again, remember the mindset of the 1920s, 30s, 40s you're dealing with. The men very much did see themselves as protectors of their families. That was not a universal mindset, but a very common mindset. Their, their own home ground, their veterans, they're not that unfit. Because again, think about, think about what a fit person in their 50s can do. In their 40s, uh, for, late 40s, early 50s, etc. They're not exactly that unfit compared to a 30-year-old. Or 20 year old. And they've got experience. And they know their terrain. And they're motivated. because, And then you tell them that they have got to hold their ground and buy time for their wife. Their daughters. Daughters-in-law. And their grandchildren to get away. Okay? You tell them they've got to hold that to the line for as long as they can to get for their grandkids, their daughters, their daughters-in-law and their wives to get away to safety. And then you try and fight through that line. Good luck to you. Because they are not going to go down without... They're going to go down swinging. And in the nicest way, you are going to have to fight for every inch you get off them. And the longer you get held up by them, then there's going to be the armoured forces and other forces which Britain does have rebuilt in the UK quite quickly with far better vehicles than they had in France. Vehicles that have learnt the lessons of France coming for you. And remember, most of Britain is pretty similar to what the German, uh, what the British and Americans would find in fighting in the Bocage in Normandy. So it's not really good territory for you to try and make a ad rapid advance. No. It's not a good scenario for them. Hold on, I never heard that one before. But Chainer makes the might be possible. Gemma had developed the shipborne radar after all. So, I think British intelligence was skilled. The British intelligence agency fed some real info to keep the turn, turn agents seeing me real, but usually of a late or limited or limited usefulness. Actually, I'm sorry, but I don't want to fight veterans of World War One by people who might have fought in the Boer War and World War One. Just on, Dr. Clark, on a BBC doctrine on a home garden and a garden in the interval period, a woman talked about her dad hearing they were at war with Germany again. He zoned out for two days, then went into the garden and proceeded to build a trench to spec across his beloved garden and was maybe not fine, at least better. Yep. I was asking, wasn't the Home Guard also responsible for giant fuel bomb fung uh, fugas that were supposed to serve as a giant flame? They had many ideas. Honestly, the big problem the British government had with the Home Guard was trying to find out where all their ideas were buried after World War II was over and clearing them up. That took almost longer than clearing up everything else.
Dragon Knight, the air bases further west would not have been touched here. Those could support the coast. Even worse than fighting through that line is that line after it's been reinforced for months. Also the home mm -hmm. also the home guard know they don't have to win, just slow them down long enough for the RM to arrive and cross the German logistics before the army captures them. So why do people think the British 7mm .280 rifle bullet would have been revolutionary? I have honestly no idea. That's um more one of my colleagues oh let me look him up. I'm sure I've done his book on here in the past. Yeah, can't find a moment for the life of me. It's probably somewhere up behind me, but um, yeah, there is a gentleman who's written it. Matthew Ford. If you look up Matthew Ford, uh, Knights of Gate for One, he'll be able to tell you all about that. There were also special branches of the SOE who were supposed to be left behind. behind uh, to attack uh, from hideouts and all sorts of things. Myronus, Engineer World War Two, UK sighting locations for guns. Came to bl as a bluff owned by an old man. Knocks on the door to ask about setting up a man uh, up. Man says, "Come for your guns back." He was still looking after a gun set up with World War One. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Right, so, here we go, wings on my sleeve, a bit light, but we'll get there. <laughs> In front of me was the most wonderful view of a deck I had ever had. For the first time, I could really see everything. From about 400 feet, I settled down, expecting to land on the ship at about 85 miles per hour. She was steady as a rock coming down. I did not for once have to turn and twist to get a look at the deck. Then we were very near the round down. I could see the batsman, Lieutenant Commander Bob Everett, very clearly standing out near the centre line of the deck. He was giving me a good steady signal all the way, with only a small correction to level up my wings as the machine caught the inevitable funnel gases over the stern. I felt the lurch quite distinctly. The mosquito was slow to straighten out. Her air on control at these low speeds was not go good. Watch Bob, Everett, uh, watch Bob Everett, wondering that if he did not get out of my way smartly, he would chew, uh, he'd be chewed to bits by my port propeller. As I crossed the round down, he slashed his paddles across in his irritable brisk cut signal, then I saw him dart across the deck into the nets on the port side. I did not cut the throttles right back, just ease them back in case too sudden loss of power dropped her abruptly to the deck and she bounced. She sank, I judged about two or a foot or two from the deck, and cut the engines completely. She touched the deck in a perfect free point attitude and ran forward, astonished. I felt a very gentle pull as we decelerated. We had caught the second wire. We ran very quietly to a stop. I reached behind my head and switched off the accelerometer. Then the engines. I climbed out. First around the scene were the boffins, all swaddled in their Sidcot suits against the fierce winds which tore down the deck. A few quiet words of congratulation from one or two of them. You never get more than that from a boffin. Then Flag Officer Air Home, Rear Admiral Portal, and Commodore Suffery, Chief Naval Representative, and the Ministry of Supply had appeared. Commodore Suffery was his usual unruffled self. He had the confidence he had, had confidence in the trial, and showed no surprise at the successful outcome. At least that was the impression he always gave. 
The Mosquito was struck down into the hangar for a thorough check of instruments and airframe. The film landing was developed, and it was found that I had landed at only 78 miles per hour, much slower than I had anticipated. In fact, this is usually the case when you come to put an aircraft down on deck at a carrier sea trial, or sea after the trials on land only. The sea is kind, the air flows smoother, with no trees, houses, haystacks to ruffle it, and you're not worried by obstructions in your path. The accelerometer astonishing, recorded an astonishing mild acceleration, deceleration in spite of the high aircraft weight. My sea fires had weighed 6,000 pounds. The Mosquito had carried much more than twice that load at 16,000 pounds. After the machine had been checked over, I took off for a further four landings. I was much more concerned about a takeoff than a landing. With the Mosquito's long wingspan, I would have to take off with my starboard wheel on the centre center line of the deck so as to be sure of missing the island. Thus, I would be displaced even more towards the side where the engine swing would carry me. When I released the brakes, I would have nearly full power on. Unless I picked it up very rapidly on the rudder, I could go over the side. As soon as we started to move forward, I put on starboard rudder to counteract the swing. Within the 40 knots of wind I was getting, the rudder a bit more quickly, and the rudder a bit more quickly than normally, and we got off very smoothly. I still had to be very quick with the rudder. I had an almost overpowering urge to look to starboard to see if the wingtip was clearing the island. The night on, that night on board, everyone had their own special party. At a very late hour, I made inquiries about a place to lay my weary head. In the end, it had to be found that to be the wardroom couch after the last of the celebrating call had gone. They had forgotten to give me a cabin. I felt a little hard done by, especially when I turned out in, uh, in the cold grey dawn by a steward who wanted to sweep out. And I had to be off the deck again at 8.45. I had I'd been alone so far. Now Bill Stewart was to fly me to supervise a further freelanders at steadily increased weights. Uh, we did two landings on incidents, the first a total of £16,800, the second at £17,000. We came in for a third, for which weight we'd been put up to £18,000 and touched down. The extra weight made us decelerate hard. I knew that we had picked a wire. Suddenly there was a lurch. The tail kicked and the acceleration stopped abruptly. We careened up the deck. I had a fraction of a second to make up mine. What had broken? Had the hook gone? Had the rear end been torn off? In that case, the, uh, to open up and try to take off again was suicide. Had the arrest of wire parted? If so, there was a danger of snagging another wire and tearing hook or tail right off to accelerate again by opening up engines. I had had some experience with these things by now, and I thought it was most likely the hook which had parted. I opened up instantly to full power, slamming the throttles wide open for more, far more harshly than I would have ever do, uh, dared to do normally. I had to pick up power quickly. We had used up a good third of the deck already, and we slowed it down to start with. I had opened up so quickly that I could not check the swing, which took us off to port. We rushed down towards the side, but I did not want to check the swing entirely as we were dangerously near the island. I saw that the port wheel was about to go over the edge. I pulled back gently to the stick and lifted the machine fractured off the deck, enough to miss the excurrence that cluttered the side. We cleared the edge by momentum, but we were so near stalling speed that we once again sank low towards the water. I was prepared for us to go in, but we pulled up with the wheels feet 10 feet off the sea. Bill and I flew back to Macrinash uh, in a safe and silence. All that he said when we got us out, out, out was, Well, you can't blame my calculations for that. We found that the claw at the end of the hook had sheared. The mosquito re returned to the makers at Hatfield to have the hook strengthened. When tests started again for the 9th of May, I had my old CEO of service trials unit days with me as second trials pilot, Commander Tubby Lane. For this series, our machines were fully loaded. With all operational gear on board, including bombs. As a special treat, we were allowed to drop the bombs near the ship. This got the aircraft down to landing weight more quickly than stooging around burning up petrol. The trials were smooth, went smoothly, except for one landing, when Commander Lane missed all the wires, narrowly missed the island, and screeched to a stop inches from the bows with his brakes completely burned out. We had proved the thesis. It was decided to build sea mosquitoes. It was lovely to know that they completely burned out the engine, uh, burned out the brakes, but they decided to build sea mosquitoes. So Scott, some of the airdrops were compromised, but generally the damage was limited because the agent didn't know who they were to be meeting. SOE was very good at limiting compromises. They learnt from watching what they'd done to the Germans in some respect. Come on, I'd read up that they... No, there is a um, SOE, uh, SOE as it's originally set up, the Special Operations Executive, is to be an extra port of Home Guard and do these things behind enemy lines. And it's after the threat of invasion 
passes that they start to think about using those techniques to train people to go and be a fifth column in France, in other parts of occupied Europe. So they start off as an extension of home guard, as a special sort of branch of home guard to an extent. Um, they are some very skilled, very scary people. Actually, Jim, can logistics were honestly terrible. A few days hold up in Battle France could be very different. One of the reasons Dunkirk evacuation can happen. Mm hmm. Could a sea cow help Mosquito be later adapted to a carrier AWACS plane? Theoretically, if you wanted to actually do it. They eventually don't go with it. They eventually develop into the Sea Hornet. And um, that's basically strengthened and everything, sort of all that knowledge is put in one place to develop it for the carriers and for the operations. I recall the case where the UK sent in a new agent who was captured due to them having been the ones who requested a new agent via a compromise agent. New agent left out security checks from messages and they messaged back that the, uh, you forgot the serial joke. There are all sorts of some interesting stories with SOE, so there's possibility. But usually the British are fairly sharp and not responding back. You've forgotten you the security checks. I, 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 that does sound a little strange. The British standard protocol was if you forget the security checks or don't do what you're supposed to do for the security thing, uh, don't acknowledge it. The agent's been compromised. You keep talking to keep them alive and help them stay alive, but you don't trust anything they say. And you don't give them any information they can actually really use. Yeah, most of the then, if you were tasked to build a risk fleet in the early 1880s, what would it look like? Probably a lot similar to what the Japanese built. The Japanese built this sort of fleet of battleships and large armoured cruisers, which could be second line battleships. And that's a very sensible risk fleet for them to approach. I was like, in short, the RN had a... Oh, they did go with it. The Sea Hornet did come out and was very useful. But it's the trouble is its wing distance, its wing length. It's the size of the aircraft. It's operating the aircraft from a carrier. And it's your size of your carriers. As they were just talking about, they're worried about its size with operating um, the various options. And actually, if we go to the multi-class carrier design... And you look at some of the images people have put in there, are up for it. Um, there are some very interesting designs about it, but one of the things is you have do have an offside catapult as well as a near side catapult. And sort of you have a starboard catapult as well as a port catapult. Uh, no, you have a port and a starboard catapult. And so the port catapult could well have been used for larger aircraft, and that's probably what they would have done. Also interesting to note, of course, that they have four lifts, two decade ones and two um, centerline lifts. Which would have been interesting. I could see them long term uh, losing the two centerline lifts, gaining, gaining a... Starboard side lift, island side lift, on the outside. Uh, uh, you know, but that would be longer term. There is space if you look at the design. There is space for a where you could put stick that lift. <laughs> yeah. 
The UK was crowded, but not many as many refugees managed to get across to the UK as you might think they would have done. There was the whole trouble of Dunkirk and the collapsing and the fact that they were British were concentrating on bringing back the army uh, of the armed forces, not the refugees. So most of the refugees were displaced in Europe. So yeah, could the Sea Mosquito have been used as a torpedo bomb? Uh, um, I'm not sure if the bomb bay is the right f size to carry it out. Uh, carry it out. If it could fit the torpedoes, it's a theoretical option. Holland was an interesting one. That wasn't one my family was involved in. As far as I know, I think my family... We... I think I've been over again. We've got, we've got, some, and we had some very interesting relatives in World War Two, and I think some might have been. I have a feeling they were operating in from linguistics, France, Norway, and Italy, but you know, not one hundred percent sure. Pretty much, uh, but it's basically if you build the Malta class, you probably have those things come in. Um, if you'd had the four Maltas end of service, then the Royal Navy gets a very different period. What's the next book? Next book, I think, is that one. Yeah, pretty much my family was Royal Navy, Royal Marines, Royal Air Force, and all sorts of weird, weird other things. But there was a lot of them. I designed my Malta model with along lines of 1960s refit of Coral Sea. One port lift, two starboard lifts, aft and forward of the island. Uh, why? 
Well, uh, and the reason I asked that night hammer action is quite simple. If you've got two start, if you've got two lifts port side and two centerline lifts, why are you then going to take away one of the lifts port? Why are you going to spend the money to take away that lift and take away the two centerline lifts and then build them up on two on the outside? You're basically rebuilding the entire ship and having to rework the entire scenarios at that point. You're asking for a victorious rebuild. Now, yes, you can say, well, the reason I want to do that is I want to put an angled flight deck in. And therefore, I want it to go for uh, go forward or that. That's a good reason. That is a good reason. But you could also just quite easily stick the angle so that it goes out so that that lift is actually in front of the angled flight deck. So the angle fits between the two. And then you can keep those two lifts and have a, a, lift, a port side lift and the, you know, a starboard side lift in the same position. And that's going to be a lot cheaper. It's not a perfect operational fit, but it's good. It's more than good enough for what they need, and it saves a lot of money. Plus, you're going to be taking off the gun, the 4.5 inch guns anyway. Might replace some of them with early missile launchers. Because she wasn't as useful for uh, uh, as for many, much else, nine six eight three one. She was useful to be an aircraft fairly, but she wasn't exactly the fastest and wasn't exactly the most viable as a carrier. I think, in the nicest way in NHP, you got so attracted by doing the coral, by the coral sea, you forgot the Malta, um, and the cost of rebuilding the ship and doing those things. If you want to make the major structural changes, you can, but again, don't expect it's, it's basically you're doing a Victorious style rebuild, and that's the trouble with Victorious. They were just going for the more and most expensive options the whole way through, and then surprised when the cost ballooned. Hmm. So, Volkanov gone off. Stalin prepared meticulously for his rare public appearances. Tovostoka and later Poskverej would be instructed to find a dozen interesting quotations from the Marxist classics, literature and folklore. As Antonov, one of Voshlov's staff, reported, Stalin's speech researchers helped him to choose statistics for the appropriate subject. Information is often ordered from the appropriate commissariat. Comrade Stalin selects what he wants from the material. The researchers do not provide any text. Stalin always opted, adopted a liturgical tone in his speeches. He was fond of the catchist form. Question and answer. Question and explanation. He frequently used a refrain or conscious repetition for its hypnotic effect, as he thought. And indeed, this restrained, carefully rehearsed style made an impact. 
Above all, it convinced people of his wisdom, and nothing makes leaders more popular than the people's belief in their intellectual qualities. No photograph of Stalin could be published without his, and later, Poshkarev's um, approval. Stalin liked to be shown in soldier's uniform as the personification of the proletarian sternness. Holding a child on his lap as the father of the people, in his generalissimo's uniform as the great war leader and victor. All the official photo photographs are monotonously unexpressive. Whereas those that were un un unposed and spontaneous with the NS Valsic or Nazada al Yulf, for, in for instance, while they were not the most interesting, are mostly of too poor quality to reproduce. In consolidating his personal rule, Stalin created an entire hierarchy of leaders throughout the country. One could establish an unofficial table of ranks just by looking at newspapers of the 1930s. Of course, at the top of the pyramid was Lenin's best pupil. It reported that at meetings, the audience stood to welcome the leader. Applause would go into ovation. There should be uh, some obligatory hurrahs. The autocrat would not be allowed to speak for long before genuine ecstasy exploded. The mood would be one of exaltation, near idol, real idol worship, and the epithets of praise would know no bounds. The newspapers also wrote about Molotov, Kaganovich, and Voshlov in terms such as Stalin's glorious comrade in arms, the steadfast Bolshevik Lenist, and the Stalin's commissar, the leader of the Stalinist school, and so on. Lower ranking bosses, such as regional party secretaries or heads of important agency, were referred to as balanced, true Bolsheviks, outstanding Czechists, dedicated leaders. While these people stood significantly lower down the ladder, they're in charge of whole republics, regions, or commissariats. Until 1944, were referred to as leaders on the regional scale. Those still further down were working to carry out the plans of genius for industrialization and collectivization, or organizing subscriptions for the Air Force, arranging meetings and processions, taking part in the decolorization, and covering the boards of honor with their portraits. Any who survived to the end of the decade would rise to the next level. There have been many vacancies. This table of ranks represented one of the foundations of the Stalinist system. Less people power meant more bosses. Stalin knew the po that the population, especially the peasantry, harbored hidden Trezarist traditions. Being downtrodden and ignorant for centuries could not but leave deep marks and a rational faith in the omnipotence of any ruler, especially one in the capital. The peasants' predisposition to cult worship was not confined to Stalin, but applied to any authority. Simple folk often wrote to Stalin. Replies were written by one of his secretaries, who ordered local bosses to deal with the petitioner's requests. Often, Stalin replied in his own hands. Photocopies of such replies are to be found by the dozen in the archives. For example, to the Clinton family, Leningrad. Dear comrades, because of excessive work, I am late in replying, for which I apologize. I have already seen to your request. Vouchers for 100 rubles have been sent to the Central Committee of the International Relief Organization for fighters of the revolution and 300 rubles for the plane of the Revolution Council and District of Copa, and pioneer of mass collectivization, and close a photo which the kiddies asked for. Greetings. Stalin. Such letters were later made the object of massive propaganda campaigns at every level as examples of leaders' simplicity and concern for the people. It is clear that Stalin was not only preoccupied with what today would be called problems of management, but also with a technique of one-man rule. He made a careful study of Vivorsky's On the Nature of Absolutism, and Alexandrov's The State of Bureaucracy and the Absolutism in the History of Russia, Yukazmin's The Fate of a Ruler and similar works. His approach to historical literature was evidently not that of the disinterested reader. He was looking for analogies, studying recipes on the technique of power, and the psychological subtleties. He learned, for instance, that his speeches at important meetings in the Kremlin made a big impact on the minds and emotions of his audiences. In the course of 1935, he spoke in the Kremlin to a meeting of railway builders, builders two women shock, shock workers from the sugar beet collectives, two outstanding combine operators, men and women Kozlnoks from Tatarstan and Tuzmekistan, tractor drivers, and so on. Every such meeting was publicized in the press and shown on cinema newsreels. As his popularity grew, however, Stan decided it would be political to reduce the frequency of such appearances. The less he appeared, the more significant the appearances would be. And his seclusion would enhance the official legends, myths, and established embellished cliches about him. A country that has lived for centuries under an autocrat cannot shed its psychological skin by incantations alone. In his time, Stalin therefore laid special emphasis on creating faith in the leader, on his care and concern about the people in his fairness. 
He blamed all his mistakes and crimes on wreckers and bunglers, on the stupidity of clerks and on local leaders who either did not understand or garbled his instructions. This line worked without a hitch. Even today, there are people who claim that Stalin's tragedy was that he trusted Yezhnov and later Beria, that there was much he did not know, that he did not know the extent of the repression. There are all these echoes of the subtle brainwashing campaign Stalin ran for many years. Externally, its essence was simple. All victories and successes were due to Stalin. All excesses, abuses and defeats arose from his orders not being carried out properly. Stalin's popularity is also explained by the low political culture of the broad masses, which I mentioned. As soon as he realised that he might become the long-term leader, the first sign came in 1927, was confirmed in the 17th Congress in 1924, Stalin set about making this an attractive proposition for the people. Films and books began to appear which dealt with the subject of strong personalities, dictators, possessive stars, Alongside genuinely revolutionary art, works were produced which rendered the role of the individual absolute. He personally consulted Sergei Eisenstein and Nikolai Koskov about the image of Ivan Terrible in the film of that name. Stalin's entourage did much to enhance his popularity, praising him to win his good graces. Being suspicious, Stalin saw meaning or intent in every careless word or gesture. He even scrupulously analysed the bland, safe articles of ad adulation, identical but for their titles, that were to celebrate his 60th and 70th birthdays. He went through piles of books and magazines containing references to him. His vanity was insatiable, though he could hide it in public to bolster the myth of his extraordinary modesty. For the purposes of propaganda, and no doubt to carry favour, his entourage vied with each other in the search for epithets, elevated comparisons, historical analogies. They lost all measure of common sense. In 1939, with the meat grinder still in operation, Stan's assistants, Prosperev and Davidsky wrote of him as a man endowed with the highest humanitarian qualities. The article entitled Teacher and Friend of Mankind includes such lines as Stalin entered the revolution with the image of Lenin in his mind and heart. He thinks of Lenin all the time. Even when his thoughts are immersed in problems requiring his decisions, his hand will mechanically fly and mechanically, automatically doodle the words Lenin, teacher, friend. How often after a day's work we have carried... Away pages covered over the length and breadth of these words. It's interesting. You have to meet, remember, it is written after Stalin's gone by someone who is trying to carry a favour with the new regime. That does affect things. Belfast is stronger than I thought she was. <laughs> uh, I think it could work. It depends. Uh, you have to remember... Yeah, I think it would work by itself, Light Armor Project. I understand why you're saying no, but I think it would. Light Armor Project, this is human and is completed early in the mid 50s, optimized to utilize new concept of angle flight decks. I think you might get more starboard lifts than port lifts, though this is at odds with ships are designed. Yes, it depends on when they're completed. It does. If they're completed as designed and modified later, there's going to be a very big difference than if they're completed as they could have been in the 1950s. Take care, Morgan. So actually, there's a good joke going around that Kirby ships are good self-defense weapons. Well, they are very nice. And they are, I have to say, again, I will say they are absolutely very nice people. And when I message them to go, um, I don't think you sent me the right, the right pack of pieces. They went, yeah, da, 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 da. They looked up and went, oh, no, we haven't.
I'm just evening out the guns quickly because they got knocked. Oh, good now. Mm -hmm. She is armed with her four inch. So since Santa Canary is moderating, if someone mutes him, can he unmute himself? I'm not sure about that. Excuse me a second. This one is me getting up and mo moving because my leg is starting to cramp. Ouch. It's mostly better. Shouldn't be better. That should be better. Oh, that should be better. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's a bit cruel, Dan. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> oh. Uh, no one can seem to unmute you. I can't even unmute you, so I can hear it now. <sighs> Damn! Seriously. Too much power. Too much power. You didn't mean to do it, you just wanted to see if you could. Now, can a muted Seneca Nero mute you? That's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. Could he? Right, right, yeah, you should have given it to the guy who does the next the least amount. That is not me. <laughs> oh. You don't have... Melanie doesn't have the option to mute Dan. This is probably sensible, as it means that my... My, um... Admins cannot all mute each other. But you have to remember, Dan is the only special admin at the moment, because we are testing out whether we need a special admin on this channel. So he has just abused his power, which I gave to him because the choice was between him and Melanie. And I decided on Dan, really, because 
He is within range of me quite regularly, so if he abuses his power too much, you can all see me wa- I will give you video of me water pistoling him. Okay, Dan? Just saying this. Mean to do it. I just wanted to see if I could. Could what? But um. <laughs> uh, options are report, block, and go to channel for our summons. Mm -hmm. You need a bigger water pistol. Oh, trust me, I have some big ones. Oh, it's going to be a good. It's going to be a good last book. It is a good last book. Tyrants make things interesting. Yes, they do. But you know, Dan's been fairly good. Fairly good, barring from wanting to also be someone who had blocked Seneca Nero. So admin training is similar to cat training. Poor behavior equals spray bottle. Yes. Obviously. Then there's asking the political. Had an interesting article about the cemetery. Cool. Now I have Seneca. Now I have blocked Dan and can't see his messages anymore. How do I unblock him? Uh... Well, I can see still see him on the chat, so... I have no idea. Seneca. Honestly, I don't. Uh... <coughs> I will try and work this one out. I think you might have to go to your own channel thing and find who you've blocked as people, and you might have blocked him individually for you rather than on the channel. So you might have to go to your page on YouTube and go to your security settings and look, look through blocked and contact people and find him. Can I fix Dan's privilege? I, 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 I could remove Dan's privilege just now, but I'm supposed to have at least one. And as said, at the moment, and it would seem sensible for what would what's going on later in the year, so Dan is being left with it for the moment, due to what's happening as the year goes on. But that is going to be something he's going to have to think about, because... He could be spending a lot of time in close proximity to me this year. In which case, I will have plenty of time to get revenge. Or revenge it. 
as I teach my little cousins to say. Revenge will be mine! Revenge! Or is it? I know there are multiple interdict interdiction campaigns in both wars, but when interdicted naval supply chains specifically. Um, What do you need a special ammo for? Okay, so if I go to the sort of the whole system to explain the special admins. And customize channel. Now, a managing moderator is they have the same capabilities as standard moderators, but in addition, they can manage block words and change chat modes in live. Now, you have them specifically, and you specifically need them, if you're going to be doing a lot of lives on the fly on phones, because they can still do their thing, uh, do those management things on their phones. So instead of normally. Whilst I, moderators can do all the things they can do, that can remove comments and help for review page and moderate live chat messages. If you're with someone and it's live, and let's say you are doing like what happened perhaps in Canada, it's helpful if you have to per if one of the people with you who's also with you has the ability to do the managing moderator role. So let's put it this way. The reason I've promoted a managing moderator is because it's to an extent to get used to it, but also because of what's happening later in the year. Not because, honestly, I really needed one for these lives. Because, to be honest, I can deal the stuff while these lives are going on as a rule. If I need to, I can say I've got to do some chat moderation and pop in. But, um... Yeah. They also have something called an approved user. Which means they always get to say whatever they want on the channel. Which I haven't got anyone on there. Um, we have a fairly large number of... People. Apparently, we have the Kofi bot active. So, if someone gives, puts money into Kofi, apparently it will show up in the chat stream. It's supposed to, anyway. Nightbot, stream, uh, Streamlabs, of course. Um, for when I'm doing the mobile chat, uh, the mobile stuff. <laughs> Who knows, Anuk? It'll all be announced at the end of this week. So, you'll leave us alone with Dan. Dan will not ban people because he feels like it, because if he does it when he's with me, I will end up putting him in the water. How's that sound? <laughs> Seneca nearly banned. He didn't realise he could ban you, Seneca. That, that's something which is the problem. <laughs> he did it, and he didn't realise he could do it. Oh, that was the funny thing. There might be a bolt involved. No, it will be a swimming time. <laughs> Uh. 
Ren! So I'm going to start a little bit early on this one because I just like it. Fuckwolf FW200C Condor. On late afternoon in 1937 at Tempelhof Airport, Berlin, when Ernst Udet, chief of the technician MNT, newly promoted to the rank of general major and a long-standing friend of my father, proudly showed me the first prototype of the latest of Prof Dippling's Kurt Tank's progeny. I established a love-hate relationship with the supremely elegant Fokkerwolf FW200 Commodore uh, Condor commercial airliner. This affair was destined to not be consummated for almost eight years. Until July 1945, when I was finally had the opportunity to fly this aesthetically most appealing of large airplanes. To this moment, I recall the admiration I felt for the Condor's clean lines and majestic stance stood in the apron in front of the Tempelhof terminal building. Still very much of a shush machine, but it's every contour holding the promise of great freaks. So you can't approve me user, your mum, Alex. Uh, if she starts up her YouTube channel, yes. So, no, no, it is more that you are the approved test subject to these things, like testing you. No, please stop testing the on Seneca. It's not, a, yeah, it's not really nice. In future, Dan, if you're feeling like testing something like this, I want you to think that the person you've got to test it on is Melanie. And bearing in mind that if you test it and it upsets her, then you're like, then... Melanie is the type who will be able to track you down and also bring you, uh, uh, deliver revenge, eh? Um, that will hopefully make you think these things through in how you're doing them. But it's all good. How did Winkle Brown fly so many aircraft? He was a test pilot in World War II. There's just so many aircraft going around. And after World War II, he keeps being a test pilot. Almost exactly four years were to elapse before I was once again to make more than a passing interest in a Condor. But by now, the private role of Kurt Tank's creation had, tra tra creation had translated from Pacific to militant. Its achievements as a commercial transport, having already been overshadowed by its feats as a commerce roader, was to become, to quote wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the scourge of the Atlantic, but with all its awesome reputation and fearsome array of weaponry. The application of which had perforce been accompanied by some loss of elegance, the Condor had retained all the graceful shapeness of the prototype that had left so indelible an impression on me. By that time, in the summer of 1941, I was a young fleet air arm pilot with number 82 Squadron, a Grand Martlet unit deployed aboard the Royal Navy's first escort carrier, HMS Audacity, converted German merchant vessel of 5,600 tons. Such midget carriers were really the brainchild of Churchill, who saw them as party answer to marauding new bit packs, though posing a threat, major threat to Britain's survival. As we've covered in this channel, they would have been something which the Royal Navy had been working on since the 1920s and 30s, and it had been all sorts of fun to get people to sign up to it. Um, basically, Argus is the prototype. The key to the steady increasing success of the U-boat was obviously its partnership with the military version of the FW200 FW Condor, which serviced the eyes, shadowing Allied convoys, and then acting as a Fulungshanta, or contact plane, by sending out continuous DF signals. The tactics of the Condor were controlled by the Befershalba, the U-boat, a flag officer submarines, no direct communication taking place between the aircraft and submarines that it was responsible for directing. The Condor had been a formidable uh, character, had been given a formidable character by the Allies, who saw it as a winged barracuda. Its auspicious success certainly entitled it to the reputation of being a voracious killer. Between the 1st of August 1940 and 19th of February 1941, the Condors of 1st Grouper Kampfschwager 40, operating along the uh, Bordeaux Mariac, flying out across the Bay of Biscay and following an arc around the Irish Atlantic coastline to attack targets of opportunity before landing at Stavangerschola or Trondheim Vaz, accounted for 85 Allied vessels, totaling some 363,000 tons. During late summer 1941, the Fingerfuhrer Atlantic radically changed the Condor's role, from commerce radar to that of U-boat cooperation, issuing instructions to KG-40 that its aircraft were no longer to initiate attacks and would seek cloud cover when attacked. 
offering fight only if absolutely necessary. A squadron armoured officer, however, I was unaware of that fact that the Condor's activity had become less aggressive, as I performed my duty of briefing our squadron's pilots on the armament of enemy aircraft they were likely to counter, and the most likely to be met on the voyage to Gibraltar on which we were bound was the FW200. In retrospect, it would seem that the intelligence brief from which I worked had been compiled with a little too much enthusiasm, as it credited a condor with capabilities that, at the time, was to reveal it did not possess. At this juncture, the improved FW-200C3 had made its operational debut, and according to my brief, it was a, this was a veritable flying armory. It could allegedly lift four 1,000kg bombs beneath its wings, and augment these with a pair of 500kg bombs in, ver in ventral gondola. A mighty 5,000 kilograms, or almost as much as a Lancaster. Defensive armament certainly appeared daunting. Apparently included a fixed forward-firing 20mm cannon in the fuselage nose, a second 20mm weapon in the nose of the gondola, which fired forwards and downwards for a 55-degree angle of depression and possessed a lateral transverse of 28 degrees on each side of its central axis, a third firing aft and downwards with similar angles of movement, and a fourth in a power turret which, rotating through 360 degrees, was mounted immediately aft of the flight deck. If this array of artillery was not enough, the Condor was also created with a 30mm gun on a scarf ring type of mounting, firing from its aft dorsal position, a pair of 7.9mm machine guns mounted behind a sliding beam, uh, sliding beam panels, and two similar weapons firing through the window, side windows. In due course, it was ascertained that the Condor's bomb-toting potential, as indicated by the brief, was greatly exaggerated. Bomb load invariably being restricted to a quarter head of 250 kilogram bombs for offensive or reconnaissance missions. But offensive armament was not so far out, give or take a fixed forward firing cannon and a pair of machine guns. The intelligence boys have perhaps led us to believe that the defensive capabilities of Condor were even more awesome than they were, in fact were, and in sort armament different, differed somewhat from Amrashd Baths to Amrash Baths. The defences of the Condor were nevertheless to be treated with the greatest respect. We squadron pilots discussed for hours on end the best means of attacking this wing porcupine, which apparently possessed no undefended spots. I eventually decided for myself that the best of the way in, in, in was a flat attack from head on, always disconcerting for those under attack. Moreover, such an attack would be directed at the Condor's most vulnerable items, its pilots. Thus armed with each of, each of his own pet theories, we eat pilots with our six marlets set sail in September 1941. As they got to Gibraltar Brown convoy, the aircraft had parked on the aft end of Audacity's tiny flight deck, which measured a mere 128 metres by 18 metres. Since there was no hangar, the martlets were permanently on deck, and the foremast, uh, foremost had only 91 metres in which to take off. The Audacity's maximum speed was only 14.5 knots, and so it was ver all very tight. This applied particularly to the landing, as with only two arrested wires, a barrier and its associated safety tripwire, so the pilot's skill on a rough sea was just about the ultimate. Quite apart from risk involved, there was a hard fact that any accident to one of our martlets depleted the convoy's operational air cover by one sixth. Our convoy soon ran into U boat trouble, and on 20th September, after a knife attack, which cost us three ships, our rescue vessel, prominently displaying red crosses, was attached to pick up survivors. It was then that a condor had been apparently, uh, that had apparently been channeling the convoy could not resist the temptation offered by a lone ship. Its low level bombing run, leaving the fences of the rescue vessel in a massive flame. The Condor barely had time to close its gondola doors, however, when it was pounced by two of our martlets, flown by Sublutants N.H. Peterson and G.R. Fletcher, which dispatched it in a single concerted quarter attack, the entire tail end of the fuselage breaking off. Analysis of the first kill filled the off-duty hours of the pilots and produced some interesting conclusions. Firstly, as the attack had taken place 1,450 kilometers due west of Brest, it was obvious that we were going to be within surveillance range of the Condor all the way from Britain to Gibraltar. Secondly, it was accepted as possible that the Condor's crew, coming out of the cloud cover for a quick low-level bombing run, might not have seen the Red Crosses on their target until virtually the moment of pressing the bomb release button. Thirdly, it was decided that the quarter attack by a Martlets had succeeded only because of the element of surprise. The Condor's crew was certainly busy assessing the results of the bombing, barely having time to open fire. Finally, the two Martlet pilots that had engaged the Condor were convinced that the concentration of their fire on the rear fuselage Coupled with the evasive action being taken by the Condor's pilot, was using, who was using coarse rudder movement, resulting in tail end of the aircraft airplane breaking away. 
Regard to last conclusion, we did not really see this that this had a revealed uh, had revealed an exploitable weak point on which to concentrate attack under normal conditions or full defensive fire from that condor. Of course, we had then then had no means of knowing that we had quite fortuitously discovered the Achilles heel of the condor. That as a legacy of haste with this commercial transport had been adapted to its task and sufficient a serious structural weaknesses. Virtually no structural changes have been embodied in the process of changing the condor's designed role, and a structure intended for prosaic flying at medium altitudes, anticipated for an airliner, could hardly have been expected to prove adequate to strain of continuous operational flying at low altitudes for long periods and the violent manoeuvres often required when taking evasive action. There were there to be many cases of rear fuselage failures during landings despite the attempts made with the FW200C3 version to beef up the structure. The next combat between martlets from a day of Vasity and a Condor was to be very different. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you, Rowan. Right. Deferred I think just think my design achieves more. Sub the argument of spend more now, save money time, but again, I defer. It's a case of don't defer, but it's a, just a case of it depends how far along the construction is. You might end up with both. The ones which were further along construction could well go the way I suggest, and the ones which are less far along could go well or go the way you suggest, because it's the thing is, if they say it depends how much money they're prepared to spend. If they're not prepared to spend, they're prepared to spend only the basic amount of money. Then it's going to, at bare minimum, it's going to probably end up with a 2 2 formation of 2 being like I and 2 being like you. I suggest. Because um, this is, of course, on the Malta design earlier. But if it's if it's different, then it's, you know, it's possible. It depends. If they have more money, they might standardize. This time, the Condor's crew was on alert. The Martlets again made quarter attacks, but one of the Martlets was shot down on the first firing pass, succeeding only setting one of the engines on fire, although the second Martlet finally succeeded in finishing off the Fokker Wharf. This combat only served to, to further my conviction that a head-on attack was the most likely to succeed with impunity to the attacker, and my chance soon came twice in succession to put my fear into practice. It proved to be much more difficult than I had imagined to get in position for a head-on attack, and indeed, my first such attempt was largely the result of a chance confrontation after losing my quarry in a cloud. Once committed, the head-on attack is a hair-raising affair as you close at high speed with a large aeroplane belching fire at you while you are glued to a gun sight. I was fully occupied in signing firing and breaking away, uh, breaking away over my target, but I can imagine the Condor pilot must have been going through hell. Uh, sitting behind his controls, just flying straight and level and praying his gunners would swap this portly little wasp, spinning venom directly at him. One such pass was enough, and my last impressions were of the Condor's windscreen crumbling under weight of lead, spewing from my 12.7mm Brownings, and of the very violent evasive action necessary to prevent collision with the monster. The result of my second encounter with the Condor was similar, but this time I knew that there could be only one head-on attack, and I was therefore more calculating setting it up properly. Not all our attacks on Condors were by any means successful. However, KG-40 pilots were adept in the art of using cloud cover, and were mastered in technique of gently manoeuvring to bring maximum firepower to bear against the attacker. Indeed, our only other success, the fourth combat kill of the voyage, resulted from another head-on attack, which actually ended in the collision in which the sturdy little martlet survived and the condor did not. There is a reason I will forever love the Wildcat. There are very few aircraft which can pull off an Eskimo maneuver and still flying. The Audacity certainly came as a surprise packet to the flag of Atlantic and hit Camshaw to Wada 40 and its condors to the hardest blow they were ever struck. More is the pity that she was destined to have such a short life in the Royal Navy service, being sunk by U-751 on her fourth convoy trip after a seven-day seven running battle with U-boats and their attendant condors. The cam ships of 1940, with the Hurricanes being catapulted in the air outside the condor, were a sign of Allied desperation, but the debut of Audacity and escort carriers that will follow her marked the beginning of the decline in effectiveness of the condor. Though I finished the tour of duty with a healthy respect for this commercial transport to Atlantic Marauder, it was to be said that the Condor possessed little more than a respectable endurance to commend it. That it was an improvisation forced on the other commander, De La Fofa, by a lost gamble that the Heinkel HE-1177 would be available for long-range armor reconnaissance and any ship rolls. This as may be, but the, uh, the Marlitz uh, pilots far out of the Atlantic certainly considered the Condor a formidable opponent, and impoverished, uh, improvisation or not, it certainly established an enviable record over the Atlantic for two years. There you go. 
I'm sure a suspicious, a suspicious success of playing. So one, I thought the swordfish would be considered as surprising success. I'm the clock. I'm beginning to convince you're attempting to blow a ship in half in UAD. I'm not sure, but I might do a Twitch stream on Monday evening if I have the time, where I'm going to be trying to re relearn my skills in naval in fleet command in total Empire Total War. I'm not sure. I wasn't really knowing what I was Drak is done doing today, so yeah, Doc is probably going to 11. I am going to 11, but that's because if you look at the descriptions down below, you'll notice that I have, um, I've worked out the timings, and I've given each one roughly 15 minutes. So yes, I'm doing roughly, I, I, I worked it out for roughly a four hour stream today. Eskimo Munava. Yeah. The um, Martlet in question, or rather Wildcat in question, managed to lose the tip and a section of its propeller, but still kept on flying. Yeah, I think Thrak wins on the Sunday broadcast. He does six hours of dry dock, and then he does a live. I'm fairly certain he wins on the Sunday. He, well, if not that we're having a competition, but... If there was a competition, he trounces me quite happily. And I have no qualms about that. I would love to... I have to admit... I would love to be in a similar situation as him in terms of the financial security of YouTube, etc. coming in sometimes. But he deserves it all. He really does. You have not seen it. You cannot imagine the amount of work he does. He's amazing. And I am so lucky to be uh, to have him as a friend. And chat naval history with him on a regular basis. It's why I love, one of the reasons why I love doing Bill Trump. I get to sit down and chat with him and Jamie about naval history once or twice, you know, two, two to fr between two and four times a month. It's just brilliant. Ah, yes, the total war. Will the doctor have enough time to take America and then all of India and turns out? Who knows? Well, the cats did okay in the Pacific. Um, they need to be used correctly. There is things like the... Fact weave, etc., which... If you're using a wild cat correctly, if you're thinking about it tactically, you can uh, they can be really menacing in the Pacific. Well, they have to be used properly, though. I'm sure that's one. It's, it's amazing that I noticed that you started with the live when I was leaving school, got here, and you're still live. I'm sure there was a lot less fighter versus fighter for carrier fighters in European fighter. Um, Derp Squad, there's this thing called the, the convoy battles in the Mediterranean. There are a lot of fighters which get involved in that. There are a lot. Yes, there are a lot more bombers, and yes, you hear more about the bombers coming in. But, yeah, there were often fighters as part of the raids as well. So there is plenty of it. It's just... <sighs> the thing is, you have to remember that the, the, the trouble is... The convoy battles aren't as cool... In many regards, as the big American set piece fleet battles and American Japanese fleet battles in the Pacific, they're these neat, discreet things where you have these sides come in, they sink ships, and boom, boom, boom. Whereas when you're dealing with the convoy battles, especially when you're in supplies of Malta, 
The purpose is to get supply ships through to the other end. You don't sink an enemy fleet. You shoot down a lot of aircraft as you go through. You're taking damage the whole way through. It's just not as cool. It's not talked about as much. But they do have a lot of the co a lot of combat going on. Never mind. Will Dr. Clark be allowed to privatize the Congress of Union of some kind? Uh, my plan is to not use the East India Company. My plan is to go through Salon. So I plan to take Salon off the Dutch at some point. Either by conquest, purchase, or extortion. Um, or if they get themselves full to the French, then I'll just take it off there. Then I'll just take it because it'll be independent. And... Um, then use that as my base in the Indian subcontinent and work my way up. The Finns did well to Bruce Buffalo. They did. They did really well. Well, I have a feeling I will finish at about 11 o'clock, my time. Because so, that's when I was sort of thinking it would be. So that's going to be in about 10 minutes' time. Mainly because I have to teach tomorrow. Which means I have to be awake and, broadly speaking, compass mentors. Dutch have been conquered by the Spanish. Not yet in my... St I don't think they have been in my thing yet. They have... Um, they haven't been knocked yet in... Uh, they haven't been conquered yet in my... Um, my empire. Hmm. No, I haven't done pedestal convoy, I think. I think I mentioned pedestal at various points, but I don't think I've done a pedestal convoy video. Mainly because I'd want to record that with Jamie. And we haven't sat down to do it yet, but um, and that is on my plan. To record it with him. This one, the fact we... Actually, no, the, the German, the, the Japanese didn't work out a counter for it. They always had theories of how to counter the fact move, but ultimately you can't really counter it if you're in a zero. You break off, which means you don't kill your Japanese, you don't kill your American plane. So, yeah. There was other ideas which was, oh, we strafed them. Well, the trouble is they're weaving. Which means they're looking multiple directions. Which means if you start coming in from an angle, one of those pilots spots you and you get engaged. Drac will win the longest stream of the day. As I said, I'm not really worried about that one. I have to teach tomorrow. Drac doesn't have to teach tomorrow morning. There is a small difference. I would... I will probably watch a fair bit of his stream. But I will be... In a place where I can relax comfortably. With big puffy pillows. Well, actually, no. Uh, this is me, so they are not big puffy pillows. But, you know, they're, they're, they're comfortable for me. I'm told they're not com they, they're the sort of pillows which would not be comfortable for any other human being. But my flat pillows, which uh, which I have, got, uh, well, I have got, are a perfect size for me. There was a lot of thought reparations given to a land base you can not need deterrent, but the trouble is the suitable ground for land based deterrent to be in is very limited supply. In terms of ground which is both 
solid enough to build the kind of launching facilities in you need it and secure enough to build launching facilities you need and also flat enough and with enough infrastructure you can actually build those facilities and within the budget the British government was going to do. So that's why they ended up going with first V-bombers and then eventually with the submarine strategic deterrent. Because frankly, all that land is in the wrong place as far as the gun's concerned. Enjoy, Stafford. Now comes also Wildcat wasn't as hopeless in one v one combat as zero either. Just you have use energy fighting. Basically, the zero is great as long as it can do a zoom and boom fight. As long as it can do the high speed, high high maneuvering fight, that's great. But the moment it's facing an opponent which is able to bully it, then you have trouble. And you don't have to be that. You just have to be fast enough to be bullied. You don't have to be as fast or faster than it. You just have to be fast enough to be able to bully it. You're teaching. Teaching is money. Money equals books. Books equals joy. You'd think, but at the moment, YouTube, the support of my patrons and the lovely people who subscribe and do super chats and super thanks and all those things, equals money, equals books, equals joy. Teaching equals... Teaching equals... Fun time with the students chatting away, helping them. Equals occasionally getting paid the right amount at the right time. Equals occasionally being able to afford to live. This one, I thought the Japanese pilots decided on NG fighting the pack weave. They didn't have as long to shoot, but also the weave partner would have struggled to get a bait faster. They did try to do the high speed maneuver, but the trouble is with doing the high speed maneuver is that the fact weave is not just one two planes. See, if you're doing a simple fact weave of two aircraft, that would be that would be m deal with it. But the thing is, as fact designed it, you're supposed to have two pairs of aircraft doing the maneuver, and that makes it just a nightmare. And also, when you have two pairs of air maneuvering aircraft, you have the full squadron set. So you have two pairs up here at this height and two pairs at his height maneuvering along. And suddenly, it's a whole thing. So if you've got an individual, individual aircraft or an individual pair of aircraft, you can do it. You can do the zoom and boom attack. But if you have the full squadron doing their flight and doing their manoeuvring, the fact weave will get you every time. The two nations I know of with significant land-based nuclear deterrent are US and USSR or Russia. Does China maintain land-based missiles? Yes, they do. Um, they maintain, I think... I don't think France maintains any. Um, but North Korea also has some interesting things. Plus, I think, if I remember correctly, Russia, China, and North Korea also maintain rail-based missiles. I'm never quite sure about the Americans and their rail-based missiles. Sometimes I read people talking about them as if they have them, and sometimes they talk as if they, if they have them. And sometimes I wonder if they possibly don't have them deployed anymore. Sorry. Um, I just realised I'm stretching my ear out, and I'm going, "Why am I? What's in my ear?" I think I've managed to get hand gel in my ear. I don't know how. Oh well. Thanks, Cody. If memory serves, controls in the zero become very hard at higher speed, so if speed wasn't kept higher, Wildcat would actually outreturn it. Mm -hmm. Remember, Dr. Luck, I know propeller aircraft tend to turn better in one direction, got to see a talk. Did ships have such tendencies? Uh, not once they started having multiple propellers. Because often you'd have it set so that the propellers would not do that. 
Which is one of the reasons why the Royal Navy, as a rule, prefers an even number of propellers. Having three is lovely, but it can create issues. Four is better, two is fine, three is lovely, one can be an issue, but not as much of an issue as with aircraft, because it's not the same amount of revolutions per minute, it's not so high. And water is a very different, different medium than air. The US does not, nor did they ever deploy rare burst nuclear weapons missiles. Thank you for correcting me, Melanie. Hmm. Probably their book, the book's wrong. Rapper, we thought about it and eventually said no to rail. It was cancelled in the late eighties. As said, it was. It's a bit confusing because let, let's put it this way: this is my experience with British procurement systems. As a rule, when we've cancelled it after we've already done some testing, we may or may not have some systems we use for testing. Those systems tend to disappear into somewhere and may or not may may or may not still exist twenty to thirty years later, um, and pop out if they suddenly need them and suddenly go, "Oh yes, we have this system." So yeah. That's right. If they only got Gloucester Sea Meteors in World War II, how much overkill there? Well, if you've redesigned your ships to deal with them sufficiently, and that means putting in um, port side, port side accelerator, uh, port side accelerators, as the British called them at that time, catapults as they'd come later in post World War II. Uh, so if you've got port side accelerators put in on, let's say, probably the Illustrious class, Ark Royal, etc. Um, how useful would the Sea Hornets be? That's, especially if they come in service with their radar and all the other things, then you have a all-weather, all-night, all-weather, all-night, all-weather fighter and interceptor aircraft, and frankly, that would probably wipe out most problems for the Royal Navy in World War II. They were never going to get into service to have an impact because it did take too long, but if they actually been available, if they had been available somehow, then they would have been very useful. Oh no. No, I was thinking about Sea Hornets, not Sea Meteors, wasn't I? Sorry, that was Sea Meteors. Uh, sea Hornets, I was thinking about. Um... If meteors have got in service, not necessarily as useful as the Hornet. But, would have been pretty interesting. It would have been pretty interesting for them to de use some for some strike moon packages, and certainly for some interception operations in air, de air defense. But I'd say actually the Sea Hornet would have been better, <laughs> would be more useful, which is what I thought you were talking. Which for some reason I read it as Sea Hornet rather than a Sea Meteor. I'm sorry. I've been on a cigarette bat. The guy cracked the bottle and the whole thing pitched the starboard against the rotation of prop. He whacked the other throttle level and took uh, level out, uh, le uh, whacked the other throttle level out and took off. Yeah.
They investigate the many situations. They investigate rail basing of the LGM 118 Peacekeeper. They build a rail test rail vehicle, but the program was cancelled. Only 50 of the missiles were deployed in fixed silos and have or have unfortunately been retired. It was our most capable ICBM. That's a that's a, a shame. That's right. If World War Two is delayed, does that delay jets? Mm. I don't think so because there's lots of people working on jet engines at the time. It's quieter than most, but there's lots of different work going on on jet engines. Might actually accelerate them, because often the most productive technology and technological development and the most funding going into research and development is just before a war begins. Because remember, the moment war starts, you immediately start working on or focusing on those things which you can immediately turn into useful assets for fighting the war. Not so much worrying about the stuff which you could develop 20, 30 years' time. But if it's the stuff which, in, prior to the war, you're, you're trying to push forward that development as much as fast as possible. Before you pick your point to take off to develop the things into the pragmatic and practical things you can put in service. Mr. Ernst, the Japanese prioritizing range and air fleet bit them in the end of the Zero and the Dive Bomb. No, what bit them was their uh, their focus, uh, their way of management of their air groups. All these things could be got round of around if they had kept, they'd run a system of air group personnel management, which had rotated experienced personnel back to Japan to train new pilots and form the cause of newly commissioning squadrons. If they had far run that as a far more sensible process than what they did they would have had a far more viable air arm. And their aircraft would have been better able to play to their advantages. But ultimately, their industrial capacity is what dooms them. It's a sad thing, isn't it? Okay, so that early analysis, which Bellamy puts together, which is the Soviet Union, combined with Germany, Combined with Japan and Italy. Where are the trucks coming from? Think about this. Where are the trucks? And the high octane fuel? You also seen how terrible the French, uh, the how terrible the German logistics forces. And we've talked about that, about how Frankly, German logistics is amazing for what it manages to accomplish, considering its basis. And in fact, it collapses when it does. It's hardly surprising. Russian logistics is not much better. In fact, no better. The Russians are capable of building ta uh, building trucks and do have some truck manufacturer capacity. But for a large chunk of World War II, they need huge amounts of trucks imported from America. In fact, that's the most essential thing being imported from America. It's an aircraft. It isn't aircraft engines. It's trucks. To keep their logistics going. Because otherwise, they're just as rail dependent in World War II as they are today as they were as the Germans were. Thank you, Bob Fry. And so... This is the thing. Yes, on paper, Bellamy is right. They present an absolutely powerful force. In reality, I see them as an absolute nightmare. A fighting over resources, a constant war of resources. Imagine it. Now, the German Navy is not only fighting with the Luftwaffe and the army for funding, but they're fighting with the Soviet Union demanding 11-inch gun turrets and all uh, guns and all the, the turrets, etc., for their own sh for the Soviet Union ships, and Hitler probably will give them to them. Make the German Navy terrible. For the Soviet Union might build a might build their own version of the Graf Zeppelin before the Germans commission it, for which the Royal Navy will be eternally thankful because they'll get a carrier battle in the North Atlantic, which will prove the requirement for aircraft carriers, but will also end with two ships, two variations of the Graf Zeppelin sunk. Because let's be honest, that system, that aircraft handling system, is the worst thing seen since slice, worst thing cr created ever for aircraft. It's absolutely perfect for maintaining the aircraft flow, 
But as we all know, it's slow, it's horrendous before it's even built. It's going to take ages to get our aircraft and operate and put them up in the air. And that means that thing is going to be caught unawares by a strike, which is going to come in and go, hmm, here, have some dive bombs, have some torpedoes. So, I do not see it as a good scenario for them, because I see them as each as logistically inept as the other. And yes, you now have a linked up between the four powers. They can also reach to Japan. Whoopie doodah. That's going to make it great. But the Japan and Russia have been fighting a war. The Soviet Union have been fighting a war in 1939. They absolutely hate each other in Manchuria. Basically, you've got the Germans who hate the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union who hate the Germans because the fascists and the communists hate each other. Uh, even if, no matter what the tops believe, the, below, the le whole levels below is, despise each other. And then you've got the Soviet Union, which just hates Japan. That is a four-way screw, which is ripe for falling apart and fighting each other. It's just, the whole thing is, it is an idea, and it's a very scary idea from the raw statistics sitting on paper, but... If they actually manage to turn any of those raw statistics into actual war fighting capability, I'd be honestly surprised. Because you think about it, the Russians talk about going south into India. Great. First of all, you have to go through Afghanistan. After you go through Afghanistan, you've still got mountains to go before you reach India proper. Those are mountains regions. Mountains. Not jungles, which the Japanese have passed through. Mountains. And that's going to be at the end of a logistics line you haven't built. No roads, no railways. There's still no railways running for Afghanistan to this day. There are very, very small amounts of infrastructure in Afghanistan at this point. What's your option? Go down through the, through the Gulf into Iran? Well, that's fine. You can do that. But again, at a certain point, where is your logistics going to come from? You're going to have to build your logistics. And that's going to take time. And you don't want to give the British time when they're defending India. So, it's not. It's not a great scenario. Good night, Ron. Carl, 120,000 land lease trucks. I know, Germany used the same air crew mismanagement of keeping pilots in combat without rotating back to train replacements. Mm hmm. It would also have been helpful if the Japanese didn't force pilots to meet such high standards. Yep. Remember, is that Dr. Kark, what about Kordak made, Kordak made it so explosive? The pace of its reaction. I see, I've seen my fair share of graphs of Abandon fanboys. Yep. Do you think the combined structure of Graf Z and Soviet Graf Z could see its way to eliminating Burn? The Burn was... The Burn was... Uh, let's put it this way. The Burn is the only pre-World War II aircraft carrier which spends the whole of World War II not being used as an aircraft carrier. Even Argus gets used as an aircraft carrier more than the Burn does. And so, good luck transporting any large quantities of stuff between Germany and Japan through Russia over a single railway. Yeah, over a single railway, and then imagine what the American submarines based in Alaska are going to be doing about that, any stuff that tries to be transported across the sea between Russia and Japan. Just what, how would a quad pi uh, type pack work border clashes in Manchuria? Would it fall apart as quicker than it was negotiated? Uh, it could be really fun. Good in front of Afghanistan. I think that's there. That's a well. There's your problem. 
Good luck with that one. Invade any friend and pull. Oh, that'll go well. Yeah. Covers. I guess it'll be China who built a railway in Afghanistan. They might do. It'd be sensible. There's also a British army in Iran. Yeah. In that scenario, you're likely to see Italy uh, see Italy starve resources. You can see Britain get, peeling them away from that alliance before a year is up. Honestly, that could actually make the Mediterranean... It, it, it could actually end up with the Mediterranean North North Africa Mediterranean Front collapsing for, the, for collapsing for those four powers quite quickly. And that would mean Britain, as far as its position, it's, it would then be able to use the Mediterranean to funnel stuff through. But basically use Gibraltar as a blocking point to block the Germans getting submarines in through that way. And then be able to shuttle things through the Mediterranean along the north coast of Africa as quickly as it possibly could through the Suez Canal. And that just makes his life a lot easier defending its Far East territories. That's right. I agree with what you said. I was mostly adding to the F4F versus Zero description. Thank you. Just gone. Mountains with people who were last conquered by the Mongols. The conquest consisted of the Afghans pretending to pay tax and the Mongols going away. Hey, it allowed the Mongols to claim they'd won. Mm. I don't think Afghanistan has oil to transport by a uh, pipeline. Stafford. Um, honestly, Afghanistan has a lot of very interesting raw materials, mostly of the uh, buried in the ground, need to be mined kind. And a lot of poppy fields. Right, it did not help that Japan the, 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 the Japan beat their pilot recruits. No, it, there was lots of many, many things with Japan and their pilots that is just not sensible. Have seen, I ha don't think I've seen any Telegram scammers on my channel, but I would say if you spot them, please do point them out to me and I will get rid of them. Oh God. I want to talk about a burn. It makes you curious. Are you aware of any unbuilt carry design that was worse than how the burn ended up? Um, Aquila, Graf Spey. The Soviet version of the Graf Spey. Uh, the Joffre class have the potential to be better than the burn, but they could also go the other way. There is the, Fr the French are still involved in their construction. And the French seem to be at the point going very, all, uh, very um, pre-dreadnought on their aircraft carrier design. I'm not sure. I think what happens, and I have this sincere feeling, that after World War II, what happens is they take the legacy pre-dreadnought hotel designers out for lunch, and they leave them there with a limitless bottle of wine, and then they go back and then they redesign their entire fleet. Because we're using the people who were designing their cruisers and their capital ships prior to World War II. Because those are some very good designers. And I would explain what happens, because why their designs suddenly improve.
Oh, Russia might want to make a pipeline to India through Afghanistan, but that requires the goodwill of the local um, council. Mm-hmm. Too sandy, unstable to build a... Oh, they've looked at it. There are ways of building it, but it's going to be expensive. Basically, the answer to the Afghanistan railway construction is cost and time, not impossibility. The Chinese are building a pipeline through Afghanistan to take oil from the other sands back towards China. Mm. But the, the... Yes, and the Chinese have a Mongol approach to Afghanistan. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yes, but the trouble is if the most around, if they go for Iran, they then have to get it from Iran to India. And that means you either have to go through Pakistan, which would probably not be politically popular on either side, uh, with another pipeline, or you have to take it by vessel through the Straits of Hamas to India. Things can get complicated, and basically. Jack Ryan, the Soviets had a ship type plan similar to Gauss Speed, Panzer Chief. Not really, but their battle cruisers were looking at using 11 inch guns. And they were actually getting, um, they got one of the Admiral Hippers. They got, well, the Deutschland became. And that one was transferred to them, so to Deutschland. It became the Lutzau, and the Lutzau was given to the um, Soviets. Pregnant. It is now 20 past 11, and I do have to teach tomorrow. So, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to say last questions, and then I'm going to go. <laughs> uh, there have been all sorts of interesting railway constructions. Also, if you look at things, some of the railways, I think Britain was considering, when they were considering building railways in Afghanistan, they weren't considering railways like you would consider the modern main lines. They were considering narrow gauge railways like you've got in, well, if you consider there's the, oh, I think it's the Vestinyog. Um, Yeah, the Vestinyog line. So if you look up the Fistiniog line and what they uh, what they run like, that's what the Royal Navy, uh, the um, not the Royal Navy, the British government and the British uh, the British Indian government, uh, they were looking at for building a railway into Af into Afghanistan. They were looking at building a line like that. I still remember reading up in a book somewhere. So yeah, it's, it's the, it, you're looking at sort of like Welsh lake lines. Nice argument. Was it the correct decision? Well, the last Queen Elizabeth is cancelled, and one of the Revengers is cancelled. Two of the Revengers are turned into renowns, using boilers also from the Third Revenge. So, realistically, it's only the Third Queen Elizabeth which is actually cancelled. The three Revengers are turned into two renowns, using cannibalization of their parts. So, um, yeah, was it correct decision? I don't think so, but I want to see what I, I want to see what Arjun Corbin would have looked like when she was built, and if she did end up with eight 18 inch guns, I want her in service because I have tested that vessel out, as you will see on Wednesday. I have tested out eight 18 inch guns, and um, she's beautiful, and there is really not much that can fight her.
How's the training going? I heard you mentioned in a sort of stream and forgot to ask. I am slowly getting fitter. As I say, slowly. But it's always slow at the beginning, so I'm not really bothered about that. As, as someone pointed out, I think there's a quote going around in it. The first day you don't notice anything, the second day you don't notice anything. You keep going on for 28 days, you notice something. And that's always the thing I found with, with gym, with dieting. You don't notice anything for the first 28 days. You notice something in the 28 to 56 days. And if you keep it up, then you're doing better. Thanks, Malga. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Melanie6040. Thank you, Jack Ray. Uh, thank you, Ins Morrison. Thank you, Nice Security One. Thank you, Seneca Nero. Dan, stop using Seneca Nero as your test bed. Thank you, Melanie6040, Stafford, the Jack Ray, um, all the admins who were on tonight. I don't think I saw Sean or Paul, but if you were on, thank you very much. And thank you, Rapper Razorback, Calvin Gasberg, Steve Clark, Night Secret Everyone, Inns Morrison, Derp Squad, Calvin Gasberg, Atrus Verdana, Nook and Scooter Ski GP for your questions. Thank you, everyone, for your super chats, Night Heron Productions, etc. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, Richards, thank you. George Newman, thank you. Um, Steve Clark, thank you. Derp Squad, thank you. Thank you much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Oh, well. Thank you. Take care, Aaron. Good night. Bad up with him. And I'll just do this up first before I go, so you can all see these coming up for a bit. Thank you, Melanie. Good joke. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.